Testimony from five-year-old Zykuria Robinson's mother, Michelle Cannamore, forced to pause as she breaks down crying on the stand Tuesday during the murder trial for her former boyfriend, Jonte Harris. Cannamore was not alone in having to pause due to emotions on the witness stand, a Jacksonville Sheriff's officer who responded to the 911 call and the doctor who treated the child, needing to pause briefly during their testimony while describing the injuries Zykuria suffered. Medical examiners found adult bite marks on Zykuria's body along with black eyes and bruising, signifiers, they say, of long-term abuse. They showed photos in court. Cannamore read text messages prosecutors say were between her and Harris. What kind of threats did he make before? <sighs> Harris is facing charges for first-degree murder, aggravated manslaughter of a child, and aggravated child abuse. Cannamore pleaded guilty to aggravated manslaughter of a child in 2019. Prosecutors say Harris tortured the child and ultimately killed her in 2018. Kathy Swafford believes this. She's a child advocate who says she's still close with Zykuria's paternal grandparents, who, she says, do not want to relive what happened by attending the trial. It wasn't just that. He murdered her. He violently murdered her. The defense claims Cannamore killed her daughter. Harris's mother and younger sister attending the trial believe Harris is innocent. He never got in trouble, never did, you know, stuff that's like this, ever. Um, I feel like the world is really painting a bad picture of my brother. Multiple jurors dabbed at their eyes with tissues throughout the day. Okay, let's go on the record. Mr. Harris is up as president. He's up to the side. Judge, for sake of the record, I think we need to bring her out and just get some clarification as to what exactly the issue is. Okay. Uh, say, you agree? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Harris is now present at the council table. So, you guys ready to do that now? Fri Friday, or whenever we had the motions here in the floor. I'm just saying I stayed on the record. The record will reflect what my role was. All right, that's correct. You can have that back. And, uh, I'm fine with that, Your Honor. I would also move in defense exhibits one and two. At this time. Okay. Any objection from the stay on that? No, Your Honor. And would you like me to put the identification and the numbers on no, the record? No, uh, you're going to need to do that as you go through with the witnesses. You'll be staying in the floor of the yeah. record at that yeah. time. Of course. Leave with clerk, so. it, it, it be said, uh, uh, no objection pursuant to our previously filed Other motions. than those previously stated. Yes, sir. Can I put the announcement? Like one between the announcement? Yeah, you're going to do that. Right? But you're going to make sure you, as you go through with the witnesses, you're still going to identify the numbers. Yes, Your Honor. I just didn't know if the court wanted me to say previously, before we do all of that, what the numbers are now. I don't think you need to do it. Yes, Your Honor. You need All right. Ms. Simpkins wants to say you Yes, Your Honor. You didn't have um, each one individually. One I won't say that. Yes, correct. Not individually. So they are marked for identification as states A through 8A, and they'll be moved into evidence as states 1 through 183. Okay, anything else before we bring the jury out? Not from the state, Your Honor. Not from the defense, Your Honor. And stay open? Yes, Your Honor. You? Yes. All right, Mr. Hernandez? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, let's bring the jury out.
And members of the jury, just take your seats when you come in. The parties are going to stand as a show of respect whenever you come in, but you can just take your seats as you come into the courtroom. Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, good morning, members of the jury. Welcome back. Thank you for being prompt this morning. Uh, our case set for trial is State of Florida versus Dante Harris. Is the state ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Madam Clerk, if you would swear on your Please rise and use your right hand. Do each of you solemnly swear or affirm that you will well and truly try the issues between the State of Florida and the defendant? Dante Dominique Harris and render a true verdict according to the law and the evidence to help you out. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> Members of the jury, you have been selected and now sworn as the jury to try the case of State of Florida versus Dante Dominique Harris. This is a criminal case. The defendant is charged with murder in the first degree, aggravated manslaughter of a child, and aggravated child abuse. The definition of the elements of those crimes will be explained to you later. It's your solemn responsibility to determine if the state proves its accusations beyond a reasonable doubt against the defendant. Your verdict must be based solely on the evidence, or lack of evidence, and the law that I give you. The indictment that I read to you yesterday is not evidence and is not to be considered by you as any proof of guilt. It is my job to decide which laws apply to this case and to explain those laws to you. It is your job to decide what the facts of the case may be and to apply the law to those facts. Thus, your job and my job are well defined and they do not overlap. And this is one of the fundamental principles of our system of justice. Before proceeding further, it will be helpful, I think, if I explain the basic outline of how we will conduct the trial over the next few days. At the beginning of the trial, essentially where we are now, the attorneys will have an opportunity, if they wish, to make opening statements to you. The opening statements give the attorneys a chance to tell you what evidence they believe will be presented during the trial. But the attorneys say it's not evidence and you're not to consider it as such. Now following the opening statements, uh, witnesses will be called. They will be placed under oath, examined and cross-examined. Documents and other exhibits may be introduced as evidence in the case. <coughs> following the presentation of the evidence, the attorneys will give their closing arguments to you and I will then instruct you on the law applicable to the case. You will then retire to deliberate your verdict. When I give you the law at the end of the case, I'll read from a hard copy of the law, which will go back with you to the jury room, so you'll have the law to refer to as you deliberate in this case. You should not form any definite or fixed opinions on the merits of this case until you've heard all the evidence, the argument of the lawyers, and the instructions on the law by me. Until that time, you should not discuss the case among yourselves. And I now instruct you not to communicate with anyone, including your fellow jurors, about the case. No communication includes no tweeting, texting, blogging, posting information on a website or chat room or any other means at all. Do not send or receive messages to or from anyone about this case or your jury service. Do not allow anyone to discuss the case in your presence. If that happens, make sure that you leave them at once and report the matter to the bailiffs, and of course, do not view any, any media that there may be uh, of the uh, of the trial. In every criminal proceeding, a defendant has the absolute right to remain silent. At no time is it the duty of a defendant to prove his innocence. From the exercise of the defendant's right to remain silent, a jury is not permitted to draw any inference of guilt. And the fact that the defendant did not take the witness stand must not influence your verdict in any manner whatsoever. The attorneys are trained in the rules of evidence and trial procedure, and it's their duty to make all objections that they feel are proper. When an objection is made, you should not speculate on the reason why it is made. Likewise, when an objection is sustained or upheld by me, you must not speculate on what might have occurred had the objection not been sustained, nor what a witness might have said had he or she been permitted to answer. During the trial, it may be necessary for me to confer with the attorneys out of your hearing to discuss matters of law and other matters that require consideration by me alone. It's impossible to predict when such conference might be required. When we do that, we'll try to do it in a way that consumes as little of your time as is necessary for a fair and orderly trial. If you'd like to take notes during the trial, you may do so. You've been provided with a notepad and a pen for your use. 
I try not to write on the cover page. I'll keep your notes from being accidentally read as they're collected. Uh, if you've done that, that's fine. Just flip over to the next page. Do not take the notes uh, with you uh, from the courtroom during any recess. Just leave them face down on your pads or on your chairs, and they'll be there when you return. Uh, after you have completed your deliberations in this case and been discharged from jury service, your notes will be turned over to the clerk, where they will then be destroyed. No one will ever read your notes, including me. Now, if you take notes during the proceeding, make sure that your note-taking does not interfere with your listening to and evaluating the evidence in the case. Sometimes it can be difficult to take detailed notes and pay close attention to what's going on on the witness stand. So make sure that that does not occur. And remember that your notes are for your personal use. You should not compare your notes with those of other jurors in determining the content of any testimony or in evaluating the importance of any evidence. Your notes are not evidence and, of course, are not a complete outline of the proceedings. Above all, your memory should be your greatest asset when it comes time to deliberate and render a decision in this case. On the other hand, you're not required to take notes if you don't want to. That decision is up to you individually. But whether or not you take notes, rely on your individual memory of the evidence. Deciding a verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. So please disregard anything I say or do that makes you think that I prefer one verdict over another. This concludes my opening instructions to you. I'll have the final instructions on the law for you at the end of the case, as I said. We will now proceed to opening statements. First from the state, Ms. Anderson. May it please the court? Yes, ma'am. Counsel? I hit her ass across the head so she knows not to play with me. She's gonna learn. His words. Jonte Harris's words about five-year-old Zykeria Robinson. I cannot deal with Kiri bad behavior. She knows nothing or how to do nothing. It's embarrassing. I can't lie. It's like we have an idiot child on our hands. I don't like her. She is corrupt. Words, albeit harsh words, that pale in comparison to the malicious punishment and torture that he inflicted upon that five-year-old. It is with heavy hearts and the sincerest apologies that the state of Florida presents to you this tragic case of Zykeria Robinson. She was five years old, three foot, seven inches, and 39 pounds when she suffered over 30 separate injuries to her body, from her head to her toes at the hands of this man. The truth about this case is the state of Florida's job, our job, is to keep each and every one of you from the mind-numbing anger that will fill you as you look at photographs of bite marks on her arms, her legs, her buttocks, old healing wounds, new bleeding wounds, the purple pattern of bruising covering her chest, her side, and her back, and her blackened eyes and forehead. The facts of this case are easy to understand, but hard to listen to. Michelle Cannamore, at 26 years old, was the mother to two young girls, Anaya and Zykeria, six and five respectively. In April of 2018, she and her girls moved to apartment 204 at the Oak Tree Apartments off Lakeshore Boulevard on the west side of Jacksonville. At the time, Michelle had split from the girl's father, but they made a time-sharing system. And by the end of June, the girls would go stay with their father and his parents for the summer. Around that same time, the defendant, her boyfriend at the time, Jonte Harris, needed a place to live. So he too moved in to apartment 204. Michelle's sister was also living there, but that would quickly change by July. Her sister moved out, leaving just the two of them. And by August of 2018, the apartment was once again filled with the sound of two young girls back home with their mother, preparing to start the new school year. Michelle wanted this to be her little family, her little blended family, where the defendant stepped into the role of stepfather 
and man of the house. But over the course of just a couple of months, Michelle would realize that her idea of a family, her idea of raising children, was drastically different from his. You all will hear from Michelle Canmore. She's going to take that witness stand, dressed in a gray jail uniform. And she is going to tell you that she has pled guilty. She has admitted her part in not stopping the torturous abuse inflicted upon her own daughter. <clears throat> she will explain to you that as she sits there, she is facing up to 30 years in the Florida State Prison. And that despite her cooperation, despite her testimony before you here today, she understands that the state of Florida will stand before this judge and recommend that she serve no less than 25 years, just shy, just five years shy of her maximum in the Florida State Prison for her inaction, for her failure to protect her own daughter from the defendant. Members of the jury, as Michelle Cannamore describes what she witnessed what she allowed to happen in the confines of apartment 204, you will be enraged. You will not like her. But your job as jurors is to assess her credibility. You are the barometers of truth. And that is where your focus should stay steady. In August of 2018, Michelle Canmore was working at 7-Eleven. She didn't have a car for transportation, so each night that she worked, she would walk to the bus stop and take a 45 minute bus ride to her destination where she would work from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. A job that she needed in order to support her household, to support her girls, and even to help the defendant who was in school at the time. This overnight work meant that the defendant, stepping further into that role as stepfather and a part of this family, would be responsible for the girls overnight. And you will hear as their relationship progressed, Michelle then turned over another responsibility, responsibility, disciplinary. Michelle will explain to you what her idea of punishment is, what her idea of discipline is, in the form of pops and whoopings. And Michelle will tell you, a pop is merely a smack on the hand. A whooping to Michelle is a spank on the butt with her hand, and in some situations, a belt. But as the defendant fulfilled that role of disciplinary, his idea of punishment was drastically different. His idea of punishment was isolation, confining to a room with nothing in it, withholding food, not speaking to a child, beating until bruises cover Zykeria's body, and most severely punching Zykeria in the face and in the stomach. But because what happens in this house stays in this house, what was happening to Zykeria Robinson would not see the light of day until October 18th of 2018. It began on October 17th of 2018 with a phone call. The defendant's mother of his children called after there had been a commingling between the kids. Michelle will tell you about a time that the kids came over, his kids came over to play. One time, unbeknownst to everyone, that one time would lead to the fatal beating of Zykeria. An accusation was raised of inappropriate touching by Zykeria on the defendant's son. This sent him into a fit of rage. He yelled at Michelle, she has to go, she has to go. She's promiscuous, a five-year-old. In this fit of rage, he opened the front door and ordered Carrie, get out, get out, a five-year-old into, into the darkness. Carrie walked out that front door, the door slammed behind her. But Michelle wasn't gonna leave her child outside. She opened the door and told Carrie to come back inside. Before, before Michelle could close that door and turn around, Kiri was on the ground, not speaking, not moving, not opening her eyes, with the defendant standing over her. What did you do? Michelle asked. Shut up, as he grabbed a jug of water and poured it on her, trying to waken her up. 
but Kiri remained motionless. She was placed on the couch. The numbers 911 were not dialed. Michelle continued to make dinner, to feed her other child, to feed the defendant, and then she prepared to go to work. But that night, the defendant walked her to the bus stop. Kiri still lay motionless, not opening her eyes, not saying anything, on the couch. They walked to the bus stop, leaving her and Anaya in apartment 204. They parted ways. Michelle took that 45-minute bus ride and arrived to work late, only to stay an hour or two. Her coworkers took note of her ghostly appearance, but she said nothing. It wasn't until the defendant sent her a text message that she knew she had to go back home. His words, it's getting very dangerous in here, and I real deal don't want to be a part of a death of a child I don't function with. I am leaving ASAP. They're asleep, she woke, and threw up. Michelle didn't know what had happened in apartment 204 after she left. Why is he talking about a death? Why is she throwing up? This had been like the beating she'd seen before. Michelle got a ride from a coworker's son and went back to the apartment. And there, Kiri lay, still motionless on the couch, but now naked. The numbers 911 went undialed, now three hours after Kiri had been knocked unconscious. The defendant proceeded to try and wake her up shaking her, placing her on her mom, dunking her in a bathtub of water. Finally, sometime after 4 a.m., after Kiri's breath was fading, her pulse slowing, she was still motionless, Michelle dialed 911. Help, my baby's not breathing. Soon after, the Oak Tree apartment complex would be flooded with the help that Kiri needed so badly months before. Lieutenant Roundtree of the Jacksonville Fire and Rescue Department was on the engine that went to Oak Tree Apartments. And he rushed from the engine into the open door of apartment 204. There he found a lifeless child soaking wet and naked on the floor. Without hesitation, he scooped her up and raced out the door to be met by Captain Gordon with a stretcher. Both of them will describe to you the agonal breathing, a gasp for air in a long pause followed by another gasp for air in. Given her weak pulse, her gasp for air, they knew that this was serious. They started doing CPR and intubating her. And as Captain Gordon sat, sat at Zykeria's head, he started to notice this wasn't just a child in cardiac arrest. He started to notice the bump on her, her head, her blackened eyes, the scarring, the bite marks. This was serious and they needed to get her to Wolfson's immediately. Officer Griffin and Johns were also a part of that parade of help that went to the Oak Tree Apartments. And you'll hear from Officer Johns, who observed after the fire engine and the ambulance left, um, Michelle Cannamore, the defendant, and a young child standing on a sidewalk next to a red car that his police cruiser was parked behind. Thinking that that was their car, he said, I'll get out of your way, so you guys can be on your way to the hospital to be with your child. In that moment, he learned that they didn't actually have transportation. So he took Michelle and her daughter, Officer Griffin took the defendant to drive them to Wilson's to be with Zykeria. A very brief interaction, but one that will forever remain in the minds of Officer Griffin and Officer Johns. The defendant's flat, emotionless demeanor was simply unforgettable. Dr. Seldahano and a critical care team of doctors were awaiting Zakiria's arrival at Wolfson's. Dr. Seldahano will talk to you about her comatose state, her fixed and dilated pupils. In his 30 years of experience, this signified to him that her survival was low. But they did what they could. They put her on machines so that they could assess the damage to her brain to determine whether or not she would recover. Dr. Saldahano will tell you about hemorrhaging and edema, bleeding and swelling of the brain. He will tell you that he spoke with Michelle and the defendant, and they told a story. 
a story about being a running family and Zycheria falling. A story about Zycheria slipping in the bathtub. Stories that could not possibly account with the over 30 injuries on her body. Dr. Karen Shinshak, a pediatric ophthalmologist, was also a part of that critical care team. She was brought in to assess Zycheria's eyes to determine if there was any retinal hemorrhaging, bleeding in her eyes. Dr. Shimshak will tell you that what she saw in both of Zykeria's eyes was consistent. Scattered and diffused hemorrhaging through all layers. In layman's terms, Zykeria had bleeding from the front of her eye to the back of her eye. <coughs> and Dr. Shimshak will tell you she couldn't pinpoint the age of the injury, but what she could say is that these weren't just new injuries. There were old injuries there as well. This was consistent with abusive trauma. Not a fall in the bathtub, not a fall while running. The next day, Dr. Saldahano returned to assess Zycheria's status to determine if she had any sort of brain activity. And he will talk to you about the test that he did. But more importantly, he will tell you the result was that despite the 24 hours that passed to help Kiri's brain heal, she had no activity. <coughs> she was brain dead. And by 1 p.m. on October 19th of 2018, Zykeria Robinson was pronounced deceased. Associate Medical Examiner Dr. Dr. Buxbaum will also talk to you. His job was to conduct an autopsy on October 22nd and 23rd of 2018. And his search was to determine what killed Zykeria? He will tell you about four locations of blunt trauma, blunt force trauma to Zykeria's head. Galial contusions, subdural hemorrhaging, and edema. Essentially, Zykeria had bleeding in all layers and swelling in her head. This was the result of significant force. Blunt impact head trauma is what killed Zykeria. Dr. Buxbaum also observed other injuries, a lacerated kidney, hemorrhaging in her back, and a broken clavicle. Injuries that upon further examination told the doctor that this was not the result of an isolated incident on October 17th. This was a pattern of injuries to this child. Finally, Dr. Dilly of the Child Protection Team will speak with you. She's got over 30 years of experience with children. <clears throat> She has seen abuse on the mild, the moderate, and the extreme scales. And she will walk you through each and every injury from head to toe on Zykeria. Purple bruising on the eyelids. Per bruising on her jawline consistent with grab marks. Multiple scratches on her neck. Adult-sized bite marks. Extensive bruising on her arms. Bruises on her chest and abdomen. Adult-sized bite marks on her buttocks, loop marks, linear pattern bruising on her torso, more abrasions, lesions, and bruises on her legs down to her feet. All of this, along with the head trauma, the retinal hemorrhaging, and an untreated broken clavicle, led Dr. Dilly to one conclusion with her 30 years of experience. This was torture. The more Kiri was examined, the more it became evident that this was a pattern of abuse. This was a pattern of isolation. This was torture. Michelle Canmore was not the only one who could shed light and would shed light on what was happening in apartment 204. You will have the ability to read the defendant's own words via text message. You'll have the opportunity to see the searches that he made from September to October regarding her injuries. Now members of the jury, much like Michelle Canamore not reporting this abuse early on, she also lied about it. She lied to the doctors, she lied to detectives at the hospital, she was placed in an interview room, advised from her Miranda rights, and she continued to lie. Continued to tell this story of falls while running, falls in a bathtub. And she will tell you she did that because she was scared. She was scared of the defendant, 
She was scared of losing her children. And she was scared of getting in trouble. She is a mom. And she failed to protect her own child. But ultimately, she was tired. She was tired of cleaning up after the defendant. And she was tired of watching her daughter be abused. Michelle will describe to you in painful detail what she witnessed. It began with a bite. She will tell you that the defendant was whooping Zykeria, and he bit her on the buttocks. Michelle said, what are you doing? His response, shut up, I know what I'm doing. It then progressed into bruises, into bleeding scrapes, so much so that Michelle pulled Zykeria from school. And she'll admit to you, that wasn't the right thing to do. She should have told someone. She should have asked for help, but she did it. She pulled her from school, hoping that the defendant would change his ways, that the bruises would heal and her daughter could go back. But it didn't stop. She was afraid of losing her children, and she was afraid of him, and the cycle continued. Michelle will describe for you a day when Zykeria put her shoes on the wrong feet near the front door of the apartment. The defendant's response to that, he grabbed Zykeria by the neck, slammed her on the ground, and proceeded to hail a fury of punches, during which he put his foot through the wall. She will describe for you a day that she came home and found the defendant with a microphone stick in his hand, standing in front of a blackened-eyed Zykeria. She didn't know what had happened, but she jumped in front of her daughter and begged him to stop. She will describe for you a time when Zykeria was in the bathtub, not listening to what she was being told to do. And again, the defendant grabbed her by the neck and slammed her against the wall. You won't be left to rely solely on Michelle Canmore's recountance of these events. You'll see text messages. His words. I'm leaving you as Abby. Michelle's reply, I ain't do nothing to you but make you stop hurting my daughter because you was taking it too far. She already bruised enough, then you put a hole in the shower. His reply, so keep her away from me then. Y'all ass is slow as fuck. One exchange in a 50-page packet of messages that you all will get to see. These messages demonstrate a relationship of power and control. A relationship of power and control where the defendant wanted all the power and all the control. His words, her little girl pissed, so I beat her. Don't feed her, keep her in her room, door closed. She doesn't get snacks or drinks unless it's water. I told you not to talk to her. She gives us the silent treatment, then she gets nothing. She has a backward spirit. The devil don't be around us or nobody. I need you to discipline like me, watching her every move, and tell her to stop being so mad. It's not a secret. Gonna have her killed with too much anger. Not only did he want to control Zykeria and how Michelle treated Zykeria, he wanted to control Michelle. I have to be around someone who learns and wants to learn for rewards, his words to Michelle. <clears throat> Michelle will tell you that she wanted this little family so badly that she chose a man over her children, something I'm sure is painful to admit. But she didn't stop trying to stop the meetings. She says to him, we got to stop hitting her ASAP. She looks bad. And I don't need you behind bars or them taken away from me. You have to find something else to hit when you get mad. Please, I'm begging you. You'll also have a search history of the defendant where he's searching the symptoms caused by his repeated beatings. Broken collarbone, body shakes, pupil dilation, brown urine, blood and toddler's urine, how to get rid of blood clots. Child is shaking uncontrollably. A way to self-diagnose 
And then he would text Michelle, giving her instructions on how to heal Kiri. She'll be good around the weekend, cold showers, nice, warm sleep, food, and water. She can't wear tight clothes, and her urine was brown because she had blood in her pelvis from the look. <coughs> she has head trauma. The only way to cure it is rest, drink plenty of fluids, medicine for sleep, and eating a diet. Michelle was tired. She was tired of cleaning up the blood. She was tired of covering up for the defendant. Tired of watching her child be beaten. But her call to 911 was simply too late. Members of the jury, the hard part of this case is not determining whether or not the state of Florida has proven the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. The hard part is listening to what this man did to a five-year-old over the course of months. We're confident that as you consider that evidence, you will know in your head, in your heart, and in your gut that Johnson Harris is guilty. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Hernandez. May it please the court. Yes, sir. Counsel. Good morning, folks. <clears throat> My name is Jim Hernandez, and along with Patrick Curry, we're representing Johnson Harris this week. The evidence in this case will show that only two adults had access to the period at her home, Jonathan Harris and Michelle Campbell, through the months of August to October. We expect the state to spend a lot of time on the child's injuries. You will be receiving pictures of the child's injuries and testimony from several doctors to the extent of the child's injuries. The defense is not disputing the fact that the child was curious was injured and the extent of those injuries. <laughs> However, the pictures and the doctor's testimony did not tell you who inflicted those injuries. The defense believes the evidence will show that Michelle Canmore injured and killed her child. The reasonable doubt standard is the highest standard in our nation of laws. It is that way because a man or a woman's liberty is at stake instead of money's in a civil case. At the end of this case, you will have a reasonable doubt that John Day Harris inflicted the injuries on the child's security and caused her death. The evidence in this case will show, and this will be through the state's own exhibit, that 51 page document of text messages that Michelle Campbell wrote this message to John Day Harris. The message was written on September 24, 2018 by Michelle Campbell at approximately 1.30 p.m. and 50 seconds. I believe it will be message 353 on document page number 41 of the state's exhibit. These words were written by Ms. Campbell. We've gone to walk all the way home because little baby got an attitude because I took away the popcorn. The store clerk bought her. She thought she was gonna get a snack and I'm gonna, gonna beat her red ass. Michelle Campbell wrote the second text. I believe this is gonna be in the state's exhibit text number 347, and I believe it's going to be located at page 40 after it's introduced to y'all, that y'all get a chance to read. In that text, Ms. Cameron wrote, she caught a whole attitude, started walking fast ahead of me, almost got hit by a car. I had to yank her up too many times, finna get to the, this house, and beat her ass and then across the street. The words in that text yank her up are important because you will hear from medical doctors 
that the child Z had a broken clavicle, collarbone. The child was yanked hard. That clock, that collarbone could be broken. The evidence will also show in Defense Exhibit 1 that before Mr. Harris even came into the picture with Ms. Campbell, on October 31st, 2016, Mr. Harris did not come into the picture until January of 2018 when he first started dating her. But on October 31st, 2016, Defense Exhibit 1 will show that the child's right arm was injured, probably by yanking it. Now, Camor either injured the child's right, right arm by yanking it, or the new babysitter that she had injured the child's arm. The child couldn't have done it by herself. That's an eight page document. Shan's hospital, where you'll get a chance to read, where the child's arm was injured a year and a half before John Day Harris came upon the scene. <clears throat> Michelle Cadmore put John Day Harris before her own children. Miss Cadmore was madly in love with Mr. Harris. They went to high school together. They knew each other back in high school. Ms. Cannonmore will state that Mr. Harris was popular, she was not. And they met again at Ms. Cannonmore's job at the convenience store in January of 2018. And they dated until June. Ms. Cannonmore was dating other people during that time frame also, other men. Dr. Harris moved into her apartment in June of 2018. Ms. Canmore's older sister was living in the apartment. At the end of June into July of 2018. The two children at that time, in the summer of 2018, were staying with their father, Sophia Robinson. Now, Sophia, the father, would have them. Mondays through Fridays during the summer. And the children would come back to Miss Cannamore a couple days on the weekends during the summer. The father did not have contact with the children between August of 2018 and October of 2018. Miss Cannamore did not permit him to have contact. Naya was going to elementary school. Secure was going to child care or pre-K. Secure went to child care in August and September of 2019. Her last day at daycare was approximately September 28, 2018. You'll hear in the defense's case the child care. The teacher and the worker come in and testify for y'all. They will testify that they did not notice any bruises or any cuts in security. However, the children went to school with long pants and long sleeve shirts. And they have a policy at that child care place that no clothing will be removed to inspect the marks for the job. What's important and what you need to remember is that my client was going to Tulsa Welding School in the morning, going to classes. Ms. Cannon was dressing those children to go to that daycare center. If she would have wanted to get up from underneath in a, a situation, all she had to do was place those, the child security in a short sleeve shirt or short pants. It was her own self interest that she was protecting by putting those children in long sleeve pants and a long sleeve shirt.
you will read in those text messages where Ms. Kenmore apologizes, apologizes to Mr. Harris for her daughter's behavior. She was angry at her daughter Zakaria because it was causing a rift between herself and Mr. Harris. And we believe the evidence will show that she beat that child in frustration for that rift. Ms. Campbell even considered getting the child back to the father in a custody relationship. You will read Texas text messages of Miss Canmore that shows her affection toward Mr. Harris and shows the trouble in the relationship. One text message that you will read will be October 15, 2018. This text message was written at approximately 11.54 in the morning. I believe it will be text message number 57 on page 8. And she's stating to Mr. Harris, maybe me, maybe me loving so hard and wanting it to work so, so badly, I don't know if it's pushing you away or if it's killing you. I never had someone like you in my life. And it's sad because love is real and gentle. It's two days two days before the child was injured and had to be taken to the hospital. Ms. Canmore is frustrated and scared that she's going to lose the relationship with John Harris. And she's mad at that child. I expect you will hear from Detective Devereaux, who took part in the interrogation or interview of Ms. Kenmore. And in the initial part of the interview, Ms. Kenmore states to the detectives that she is the one that disciplines her children. Same way she was disciplined when she was younger. She whips those children and she whips them with a belt. She will explain to the detectives that the, she didn't pay the marks on Zakaria any money because she knew that they would heal. She stated in the initial hours of her interview that Janta Harris does not want to discipline the young female daughter because that daughter is not his biological. And she will state that she is the one that does the discipline in the family. Mr. Harris, on occasions, did spank that child. But the primary disciplinarian for that child, the one administering the discipline, was Ms. Campbell. And you will get a picture and a frame of mind through the text messages of what Mr. Harris stated. This text message, I believe, will be in a different state exhibit. These text messages were primarily written to his sister, Charmaine. When they are entered into evidence, they will have a state exhibit number. But this is text messages to her sister, Charmaine. In that, he sends a text message on the 12th of October. 2018 at approximately 2.11 p.m. and 36 seconds. As long as the exhibit 
as it remains the same as what it was yesterday. I believe that text message will be text 16 on page 3. And he's saying to his sister, But when she's older, when she's older, I'm going, I'm going to tear that ads up. The word ads, I believe it should have been ass up. Now, what does that text message tell you? It states that he recognized the child is not old enough to spank and to tear up or to use a belt and continuously spank the child. That was written on 10 12 2018 to his sister. But when she's older, I'm going to tear that ads up. That was his frame of mind on October 12, 2018. Mr. Harris was perplexed by this superior's misbehavior and her slow learning. He took it on himself to try to do research to try to figure out why the child was having problems. He would research whether the child was autistic. He would research why a five-year-old child was not talking. Why a five-year-old child would have seizures. Why a five-year-old child would throw tinder tantrums. Why a child might have cerebral palsy. He was doing the research himself to educate himself on why the child was slow. <clears throat> he would research the knot that he saw on her collarbone. He would research the child's urine, the brown's coat. He would research even where the child had come from. That's because he was concerned about the child. The reason why he doing that research. Now, Cadamore and Harris told the same, about the same story to the detectives in their initial part of the interview. They told, Ms. Cadamore told the story that she woke up out of her bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. And that she has a habit of going to check on her children, which is what she's telling the detectives. And that she noticed that Zakiria had peed in her bed. And she got her up to take a shower. The water was running, and the drain didn't work that well. So the water was accumulating. She was back in her bedroom because Zakiria at 3 o'clock in the morning was standing up in the shower. And then she heard a large, loud thump. And when she came back in, the child was face down in the tub. And the child was not breathing. And Jonathan Harris told her to call 911. She told a similar story. And Jonathan Harris told a similar story to the detectives in the initial part of the interview. But we expect later that when she, through cross examination, through direct examination, that Ms. Kennedy will admit that that was a fabrication. She will admit that she went to work that night and that she came home slightly after midnight and John Day Harris was still trying to care for the child, still holding the child and trying to wake the child up. She will admit that the child was put on top of her, that the child was put in the child's bathtub, she had water splash on her face, and then put in the adult bathtub after the child was laid upon her. And that when John K. Harris took her out of the tub, the child was balancing on him. And then when he went to turn off the water, the child fell and hit her head on the bathtub. This is after she came home. Then the child stopped breathing.
Dr. Harris told her to call 911, and he told her to call the police. <coughs> Dr. Harris started administering CPR to the child on the directions of 911. <coughs> the child fell accidentally when the child was in the adult bathroom. And that's what caused the child to stop breathing. <coughs> What is troubling about this case, and what is really troubling to y'all, is that John Day Harris gave a false confession to the police officer during his interrogation. He did that for one reason, and that was to protect Michelle Kennedy. Did you see? He's in love with Michelle Cameron also. Where will you get evidence of that? We expect it will also be in the text message states exhibit that will be given to you whenever the text message is between John Day Harris and his sister. We expect that to be text message number 15. It's on page three. Sent on October 12, 2018 at 211, where he describes Michelle Cannamore and he describes the period to his sister. Yeah, she, she's cool. I might engage her, but her child is a devil in design. He's talking about asking Miss Cannon to marry him, to be engaged to him. And this is on October 12, 2018. What is troubling is that in his statement, he stated at approximately, when he's giving it to the police during interrogation, He's stating at approximately seven minutes after noon or 12.07, you'll see a time reader in the upper left-hand portion of the interview tape. He states, I don't want to go to jail, and I don't want Michelle to go to jail. Throughout his interview, he states, she's a good mother. She's a good mother to those children. She does not hit those children. He's trying to protect her. As a matter of fact, he's trying to protect her so much that you'll see the detectives become concerned. You need to look out for yourself, those detectives are telling him. You need to think about yourself. You don't need to be telling us anything to protect someone. You'll listen to you'll listen to detectives in their interview. Because these are two of really good detectives. With good homicide experience. They are so good at interrogation methods that the defense believes the evidence will show that they have drawn a confession from an innocent man. What is an interrogation room? You will see it. Not much to look at. But it's basically a windowless room that a person is put into at the police memorial building. It's located at the homicide spaces. It's a good distance away from the front door and free. There's a large oak door that closes you in in that interrogation room, and that door is locked. The only way that someone can go in and out of that door is if the police let them. 
the person being interrogated in that room has to rely on the police or bathroom breaks to be brought any food or to be brought any water. The room is cold. It's cold in the fall. It's so cold that John Day Harris requested a blanket from the police. One was not brought to He was cold the entire 14 hours and 35 minutes he was in that interrogation room. 14 hours and 35 minutes. When he had not slept in over 24 hours before the interrogation began. What are some of the methods? And these are subtle things. I will try to draw them out whenever I cross examine the detective. Hopefully, I'll do a good enough job to show you the evidence that I'm talking about. But you see, the, the police can lie to a suspect in the interrogation room. And this was done. You'll hear it. It might be subtle lies, but lies nonetheless. You'll hear Detective Russell state when he's going over Miranda that everyone that is interviewed in these rooms has to go over this, has to go over Miranda. Well, that's not quite exactly true. Everyone does not, that is interviewed does not have to have Miranda given to them. Witnesses do not, are not read Miranda. Victims are not read Miranda. But when Detective Russell was initially going over the Miranda warnings, he had no problem saying that everyone that comes down here gets read this. Detective Durex. Duro. Later in their view, would say bite marks are like fingerprints. Now, fingerprints are very specific. A fingerprint is unique to an individual. The ridges, the islands, the bifurcations are unique to the individual. Bite marks are not. But Detective Dubrow compares them to fingerprints. And what is interesting is that no one ever took the measurements of those measurements. No one ever took measurements of Michelle Cannonmore's mouth. No one ever took measurements of John Day Harris's mouth. They are not black fingerprints. The police can trick a person that's in the interrogation room. You don't see that. Detective Devereaux is the assisting detective to Detective Russell, who's the lead detective, who's basically in charge of the investigation. Detective Devereaux, during that time frame, was taking notes in the 11th hour that Jonathan Harris was in that room. Detective Devereaux has his notepad, reaches in, grabs a blank sheet of paper, and basically logs it up and says, your previous story is forgotten. It doesn't exist anymore. He wasn't tearing up his notes from what he wrote. He was tearing up and lighting up a blank sheet of paper. What's interesting is that John Ted Harris, about two and a half minutes after that trip, gives his false confession. The police can hold a person and interrogate them for an extensive number of hours. <coughs> 14 hours and 35 minutes. Don't get me wrong, he was not interrogated the entire 14 hours and 35 minutes. He was in a room for 14 hours and 35 minutes. Ms. Cannamore was interrogated first. After about two to three hours, 
The detectives came in the room with Jonathan Harris and interrogated him for about an hour and a half. About eight hours after that first interrogation, they came back in the second time and interrogated them for a couple hours. The entire time, for 14 hours, 25 minutes, he was on the control of the place. John Ed Harris asked to use the phone to call his mother. He was denied that. The reason why he was denied that is because the police do not want a suspect unless they unless they want them to, which is kind of a double negative. They don't want a suspect talking to a person on the outside and getting advice. Unless they believe that they can get a recording by giving that person a phone and let them talk to their loved one. Because you see those interrogations are videotaped from door to door. That means they're recorded once the person goes in, once the person comes out. So those 14 hours and 35 minutes will be taken on a dead time. But he was not allowed to call his mother. Sometimes in situations they use this interrogation technique of letting a person call their loved one and hoping to get an admission out of them that way while the tape is running. They did not do that in this case. They used the other technique of not letting them talk to anyone. <coughs> of course, the person, the place can be uncomfortable. At this particular time, the place was uncomfortable. The, for some reason or another, the homicide team did not have the blanket or blankets that they had. Or they chose not to give them a blanket. They asked initial questions whether you're on the, under the influence of any alcohol or drugs, but they don't ask when's the last time you slept. It's 24 hours since he slept before the initial interview began. The truth, the police, its responsibility to get the person food and water, especially in an extensive interview like this. Dr. Harris was getting, I believe, a bottle of water and some chips on the ninth or tenth hour he was there in the interrogation room. The police, in doing these interviews, try to establish a bond with the person. You'll see in the interrogation tape Detective Russell, the lead detective, trying to establish that bond. He talks about his family. He talks about the corporal punishment to his child and to how sometimes he's excessive in that punishment. Leaves a red handprint on his child's body. And if you talk to his wife, she'll tell you that he was excessive. This is an interrogation technique where they're trying to bond with the person. Kevin Devereaux, interesting enough, does not do that. Does not use personal, like, personal comments. The police will, and you'll see this in the interview, they'll give you rapid fire questions. And then they will cut you off whenever you, John DeGaris is denying that he did something. And ask another question. Cut you off. Ask the question. Cut you off. Ask the question. It's interrogation technique. Another interrogation technique. Is they'll say, hey, you're a good guy. We know you're a good guy. We see your concern. We see that this is emotionally affecting you. You're, you're, you're a good guy. <clears throat> we know you just snapped. You used poor judgment. 
We know you just didn't do this intentionally. They're giving one or two alternatives to the person you interrogating. One is bad, and one is really bad. You intended to kill the person. Tell him he's a good guy, he just snapped. What is interesting is that you'll see the detectives use those words, and when John Day Harris first gives his false confession, he echoes the same words that the police are using. Body movement. You'll see at the beginning that Detective Russell is first writing notes at the table. You'll see whenever the false confession is drawn out of the client that he's moved his chair and caddy from to get close to John Day Harris. Body movement. They're very subtle interrogation techniques. They're very subtle methods that the police use. The police know your history before you go in. I expect Detective Devereaux to state that he knew that John Day Harris had never been interrogated before at the police memorial. <clears throat> These techniques were utilized by John by the detectives to draw out the false confession. And he confessed to protect Michelle Campbell because he was telling his sister that he was going to ask her to marry him. Michelle Campbell has pled guilty to aggravated manslaughter, which is count two of her charging document. Michelle Canmore's guidelines are basically 156 months or 13 years. In the plea agreement, the state of Florida has stated that they will ask for no less than 25 years. And the maximum for that offense is 30 years. Count one, which is second degree murder, and count three, which is aggravated child abuse by Michelle Canmore. Those charges are still pending. I expect Ms. Kenton will tell you that she will expect that after she is sentenced, those charges will be dropped. Ms. Kenton will, if those charges would have been followed through with second degree murder, that charge is punishable by life, and the aggravated child abuse is punishable by 15 years. That could be ranked in second. Yes, she has self interest in this case. Yes, she's being felt in that point of Michelle Cameron had a phone there 24 7. Leaving. Mr. Harris was at school in the morning at Tulsa Logan School. Call. Please. My child is being abused. And she's in work. Could call. When she dresses the child in the morning, she knows that teachers will look at that child. All she had to do was dress the child in a short sleeve shirt and pants. Why did she not make that call? Why did she not dress the child? So the teacher could see the princess, her own self-interest, because she was beating that child. I expect that's what the evidence will show. And at the end of this case, the victim will be asking to return a verdict of non-guilty all three counts. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, members of the jury will take a brief morning stretch break, comfort break. Remember during this break, as with all of our breaks, do not discuss the case with each other. 
uh, or with anyone else. Uh, just leave your pads on your chair. Before you leave, just want to notify you of a couple things. Uh, you may have noticed that there is some media coverage of the case. So two things about that. One, uh, the media is under uh, orders from the court not to ever identify jurors or show your faces or any identifications for you, so you don't need to worry about that. Uh, and of course, I will advise you, uh, as I have advised you before, not to watch any media coverage uh, of the case during any breaks, uh, either during the day or during the evening. So, uh, with that, uh, we'll see you back in just a few moments. Any pads on the chair? The state would call Lieutenant Mike Roundtree. Yeah, members of the jury, while he's coming in, uh, Officer Gazzano is with us today, so we're glad to have him with us uh, today. Uh, Chief of course, not here yesterday, and I don't think I introduced the officer Miller. Here. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you go. I do. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? Um, Lieutenant Michael Roundtree with Jacksonville Fire and Rescue. How long have you been with the Jacksonville Fire and Rescue? Um, nine and a half years. And what is your current title? I'm uh, currently I'm a lieutenant. What are your duties as a lieutenant? Um, my duties as a lieutenant is I'm responsible for my engine company on my given shift. Back in October of 2018, what was your position? I was an engineer on Engine 22. And what does an engineer do? An engineer is responsible for the apparatus and the safe arrival of the crew. Within the Jacksonville Fire and Rescue Department, are you assigned to different areas in the city? Correct. What side were you assigned to in October of 2018? I was assigned at, uh, on the west side of Jacksonville at Station 22. Okay. And what types of calls do you respond to? Um, we respond to all types of calls from medical incidents to structure fires to any unknown. All right. Are the Oak Tree Apartments located at 1701 Lakeshore Boulevard within the area that you would service? Yes, ma'am. And did you respond to a call at those apartments on October 18th of 2018? Correct. What time were you dispatched? Um, the initial dispatch, I believe, was 4.30 in the morning. And what was the nature of the call? Uh, the nature of the call was an unconscious person. Were you directed to apartment 204? Correct. When you arrived to the apartment, can you explain to the jury what you observed? Um, we made a arrival on scene. We went through the house. The front door was open made our way to the back bedroom uh, where we found a um, young child uh, laying on the floor naked. Um, and that's pretty much where we, where we started. All right, did you make any other observations of her? Um, I think just the fact that she was unconscious for what appeared unconscious and the fact that she was uh, soaking wet. Um, I think that's it really. Okay, what did you do once you found the child? Uh, once we arrived and we saw we had an unconscious um, child. I uh, scooped the child up and proceeded to leave the residence and head to the rescue unit. 
is that standard to immediately head to the rescue unit instead of doing uh, some sort of something not, in the house? Not typically um, all the time, but with children it usually is. If the child is small enough for us to carry to the rescue unit, it's easier for us to give a better quality of treatment in a controlled environment of a rescue. Lieutenant Roundtree, approximately how many child in distress type calls have you responded to in your career? Hundreds. And of those, have you had the opportunity to observe parents? Um, almost all of them. Keeping in mind that everyone responds differently to trauma, what is the typical response of parents in these situations? Objection, Your Honor, speculation. Uh -huh. um, the typical response is most of the parents are just like almost uncontrollable. We sometimes have to get JSL to interact and give us a buffer area to allow us to perform treatment. All right, what observations did you make of the parents in this case? None of that. You mentioned that you immediately uh, picked the child up as you were carrying her. Did she take any breaths? Yes, ma'am. She probably took two or three agonal respirations. What is an agonal respiration? An agonal respiration is a um, the brain's response to a lack of oxygen is essentially just a gasp for air, and it's usually an indication that death is imminent. Once you had the child in the back of the rescue unit, who worked on treating her? Um, both Engine 22 and Rescue 22 um, initialized treatment, and then I, I proceeded to pick everybody up at the hospital. So you returned to your duties of driving the engine? Yes, ma'am. Now, we often see on TV and in movies where people ride in the back of a rescue unit. Is that real life? Um, parents do not typically ride in the back if it's in a, for an unconscious person because there's already going to be four or five grown men or women that are trying to help treat, and it takes up a lot of space. So only on very minor incidents where the child is awake and you know, mother or father can be an assistance for us, um, but we'd like to leave that space open and cardiac arrest. Did the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office also respond to the complex 50 law? Correct. And did you ask them to give the parents a ride? I did. Um, after speaking with uh, the parents and realizing they didn't have a vehicle, I asked JSO if they could maybe assist in uh, providing transportation. I have no further questions for this witness. Okay. Well. Good morning, Jay. Good morning. When you scoop the child up, how are you carrying the child? Uh, just one hand under her neck and one hand under her knee. Okay, did you run the child out to your engine? Um, no, I didn't. I wouldn't say ran. Yeah, I didn't run her to the engine. We ran her to the rescue unit. Okay. All right. When you were, were you walking, wrestling with the child? Um, yes, sir. Okay. And you didn't, you felt like it wasn't necessary to put the child on a stretcher or to try to uh, make the neck stationary? The um, no, not at that point in time. The, the treatment was just, you know, the fact that she didn't have a pulse at that point was the most important thing. You wanted to get her to the rescue unit as soon as possible to yes, get sir. treatment. Is that right? Yes, sir. No further questions, Your Honor. Anything else? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You're pretty good. Thank you, Your Honor. The state would call Captain Ryan Gordon. Swear or affirm the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Good morning. 
Morning. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? I'm Captain Ryan Gordon. And where are you currently employed? With Jacksonville Fire and Rescue in the uh, Rescue Division. And how long have you been with Jacksonville Fire and Rescue? 20 years. What's your current title? Captain. As a captain, what are your duties? I oversee the other lieutenants that are at our station, the other uh, paramedics, make sure they're following protocol. In 2018, were you assigned to a station on the west side of Jacksonville? Yes, ma'am. And were you in a rescue unit that responded to the Oak Tree Apartments on October 18th of 2018? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain to the jury what you observed? Uh, we were initially called for an unconscious patient. Uh, it's about 4.30 in the morning. Upon arrival, the engine was the very first one on scene. They usually go first, the rescue falls behind the engine. Uh, the engine crew jumped out, went inside, while my uh, engineer and myself, we were unloading the stretcher, getting ready to go inside. We didn't even make it to the apartment door. We were just still bringing the stretcher to the door when they brought the child out of the house. Can you describe what you observed of the child? Uh, Lieutenant Roundtree at the time had her in his arms, and she was draped across his arms, limp. Um, did you make any other observations about whether she was dry or wet? She was completely naked and hair, hair wet. Did this strike you as odd? Yes, at 4.30 in the morning for a five-year-old, yes. Did you make any observations of her breathing? At the time, she was what we call agonal breathing. Agonal breathing is when you're taking your last few gasps of air, your body's slacking oxygen, it's trying to get those last breaths of air in. What about her heartbeat? It was very weak. Uh, normally we check carotid and femoral arteries. The carotid arteries in your neck and the femoral is down here in your thigh. Uh, very weak on the neck, which indicates the heart's really starting to um, get ready to cease. Did you immediately begin treatment? Yes. Can you explain to the jury what you all did to treat her? We got her in the back of the truck and started looking up the monitors, um, noticed that she was no longer breathing, Checked carotid again, no pulse, so immediately started CPR with chest compressions. Um, while one crew member is doing chest compressions, another crew member is putting the electronic pads on the chest. So if we need to shock, we can shock. Another crew member is getting IV access in the arms. And then myself, I was doing the innovation so we can breathe for her. Captain Gordon, if you were doing the innovation, were you sit sitting near her head? I sit right at the top of the stretcher. Yes. Did, could you observe her entire body? Yes. What did you start to notice? The first thing we noticed once we got everything going and we got the invasion going and breathing for and doing impressions, I noticed a large swelling of her forehead. Um, a big contusion on the forehead, look, uh, like a goose egg, a bump on the forehead. Uh, it was starting to swell more and more as we were doing compressions. The swelling was getting more intense. And then as we were standing there talking about that, you could see multiple bruises on the body. You can see multiple scars, so we kept mentioning to each other that you don't see scars like that on a five-year-old. Uh, multiple burn, they look like cigarette burns, they're round. Some were scarred over, some looked like they were pretty fresh. Captain, when you're assessing a patient's con condition, do you assign what is referred to as a GCS? Yes. What is GCS? That's the glass cow coma scale. It gives us a quick reference. We give a physical assessment of the body, and the GCS gives us a quick neurological assessment of the body. It kind of tells us what's kind of, a little bit of what's going on with the brain. Um, GCS is assigned numbers one through or three through fifteen. Three being the worst, fifteen being you and me right now would be a fifteen. Um, three pretty much, we say a dead person gets a three. Um, it's just based on numbers through the scale of one through fifteen on each eye assessment. Uh, motor assessment and verbal assessment. And what was the child's GCS? She was a three at the time. Did you all continue to provide treatment on the way to the hospital? Yes. Was there ever a change in her condition? No. Once at the ER, did you guys continue to assist as you turned over her treatment to the medical staff? Yes, I stayed on scene, uh, talked with the doctor that was running the code, uh, gave her details about what I'd seen in route, and helped them bank placement, get another IV access and then they continue to the code after that. No further questions. Okay, Mr. Hernandez. The child was wet, is that correct? Yes. The child was found in the back bedroom in the adult's bedroom, is that right? I have no idea, I wasn't, I didn't make it into the house. I just went off what I was told when they brought the child to me. Okay. 
If Lieutenant Roundtree said it, it was found in the back bedroom. Uh, he said bathroom, that she was on the bathroom floor, I believe. He did not say the back bedroom floor? I don't think so. Not to me. Okay. All right. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Anything else? Your Honor. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> The state would call Officer B. L. Johns. Swear or affirm the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So happy God. I did not. So 
from that point, I asked them, I said, hey, do you need a ride to the hospital? And I only gave them a ride up there. Okay, who did you take in your car? <clears throat> I took Michelle Cameron as a little girl. All right, and you mentioned Lee. Was there another officer that went to the complex as well? Yes, ma'am, Officer Mike Griffin. And did he take Jonte Harris? Yes, ma'am. Can you describe for the jury how Michelle Canmore was in your backseat? Just objections. Um, Again, relevance, speculation. Uh -huh. You can answer. So, um, not overly emotional. Um, she was she was clearly upset. Um, it was kind of a, um, I imagine somebody, you know, that's, that's sick, you know, they're sniffling, they're constantly, you know, trying to hold back the, you know, the snot and things like that, maybe hold back some tears, but not really overly emotional. Did you engage her in any sort of conversation? Not that I can recall. When you got to the hospital, did you let her and her daughter out to go inside? Yes, ma'am. Did you also go into the hospital? Eventually, yes, a short time after they went in. Were you asked to go into a room by medical staff medical staff to observe the child? Yes, ma'am. A woman approached me and told me that I needed to come in and view her. Can you describe what you saw on her body? Uh, yes, ma'am. There were, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. I didn't think I would do this. Um, there were, uh, there were four adult bite marks, um, that she showed me on her body. There were, um, there were burn marks. I probably counted seven or eight or more, um, all over the body. And, uh, those were clearly in different stages of healing. And then on top of that, um, I very distinctly remember, remember seeing one side of her face. Um, it was, it was just really bruised, really swollen. Um, so bad so that, I mean, her, if she even could have, uh, if, if she even had the ability and was awake to open her eyes, I don't think she probably could have. So. Officer Johns, was this investigation ultimately passed to the homicide unit? Yes, ma'am. I have no further questions for this witness. No. Michelle Cannonmore ride to the hospital, is that correct? Yes, sir. Did she make any admissions while she was in the back of your car? No, sir. Did you say that Jonte Harris hit, hit her child? No, sir. I know the questions you want to ask. Anything else to the witness? No, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi, man. Officer M. Griffin. Solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, my name is Michael Griffin. Officer Griffin, where are you currently employed? Uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? Uh, six years full time, nine years as a reserve officer. And prior to your employment with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, did you work for the Jacksonville Fire and Rescue Department? Yes, ma'am. For how long? 15 years. What is your current assignment? Uh, I'm assigned to patrol the city's west side. And how long have you held that position? The entire career. On October 18th of 2018, did you become involved with a call that later turned into a homicide investigation? Yes, ma'am. Did you respond to the Oak Tree Apartments? Yes, ma'am. Are those on Lakeshore Boulevard? Yes, ma'am. Approximately what time did you go to the complex? Around 4 o'clock in the morning. What was the nature of the call? We were dispatched with JFRD to assist on a uh, child that had injuries, possibly, and, and uh, assist them with scene safety. 
And Officer Griffin, um, do you have equipment in your car to assist with these types of calls? Yes, ma'am. What do you have in your car? Uh, AED. What is an AED? It's an external defibrillator. I carry it as part of a collateral duty on a medic for JSO. All right. Where did you park when you got to the complex? JFRD was already on scene, so I parked directly behind them. All right. Did you observe them um, as they were doing stuff at the complex? Yes, ma'am. What did you see? As I was exiting my vehicle, I observed uh, JFRD personnel bringing out a young child and uh, attempting to let her in the back of the rescue unit. Did you assist with um, rendering any sort of aid? No, ma'am. Once the ambulance was on its way, <clears throat> did you and Officer Johns provide transportation to two individuals? Yes, ma'am. And who did you transport? John T. Harris. Do you believe you'd recognize John T. Harris if you saw him again? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, do you see him here in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Can you just identify what side of the courtroom he's on and an article of clothing he's wearing? He's on the left side of the courtroom. All right, what uh, color is his shirt? I believe it's white. All right, um, Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witness has positively identified the defendant? The record shall so reflect. <clears throat> Did Officer Johns transport Michelle Cannamore and her daughter? Yes, ma'am. Why would you guys keep them separate? Just due to the situation, we were unsure what was going on, and we wanted to keep them separated until we had a better recollection of uh, what would have happened, maybe. Okay, can you describe for the jury what the defendant's demeanor was like? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. Oh. Oh. His demeanor was very calm, non-emotional, kind of quiet. Okay. Did you engage him in any sort of conversation? I didn't engage him in any conversation. Was he making statements? Yes, ma'am. What were those statements? Two statements I remember was, I, I can't believe this happened. She fell in the shower. Okay. When you got to the hospital, did you let him go um, inside the hospital? I did. And were you asked to go into a room by medical staff? Yes, ma'am. Where you were at in the room, could you see the child? I could not really get a good uh, observation of her due to all the medical staff was around her. Okay. Your Honor, I have no further questions for this witness. Okay. Ross, is there Yes, Your Honor. Officer Griffin, you had never met John Tay Harris before that morning? No, sir. You don't know what his demeanor is on a good day, do you? No, sir. You don't know what his demeanor is on on a bad day, do you? No, sir. And you don't know how he expresses himself, do you? No, sir. Thank you very much. Anything else with this? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you very much, Your Honor. Dr. Saldahano, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you go? I do swear. Vir 
G as in golf, I L I O, last name spelled as S A L, D as in dog, A J as in Julia, E N O. And it's pronounced Dr. Salvatino, is that correct? Sir? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, what is your occupation, doctor? Um, I'm a uh, pediatric intensivist or a pediatric ICU physician at the Wolfson Children's Hospital, Dr. Yes, sir. And how long have you held this position? Um, I've been doing this um, at the Children's Hospital since September of 2001. So that would be about 23 years this year. Yes, sir. Are you a duly licensed physician in the state of Florida? Yes, I am. Are you also a duly licensed physician in other states? And if so, please state which ones. Yes, I hold an um, uh, active license in the states of Georgia and Montana. Can you give our jury an understanding of how long you've held a license here in the state of Florida? Um, I've had a license since 1992 after my first year of training in pediatrics. And as you testify here today, sir, are you still engaged in the practice of your profession as you just described? Yes. Could you give uh, the jury an understanding of your medical training and education, sir, please? Yes, so um, I went to a, a medical school, school in the Philippines, University of the Philippines, graduated in 1990, then came to the United States for my training. I did three years in pediatric residency at the University of Florida program here in Jacksonville, and then I spent an extra year as chief resident, and then three more years in additional training in pediatric critical care also at a program here in Jacksonville at the University of Florida. And was your pediatric residency from the years of 1991 through 1994? Yes. And the fellowship or the additional grading in critical care is from 1995 to 1998. Okay. And was that done here in Jacksonville at UFL as well? Yes. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, can you give Dr. Saladino the court and our jury an idea of the types of patients that you care for within the pediatric ICU, the intensive care unit? Yes, um, the pediatric ICU at the Children's Hospital downtown at the time of this incident uh, was a 20-bed unit uh, in which we care for critically ill children with medical conditions, including those who uh, came out of surgery in a critical state and also those patients who had critical injuries as a result of accidents or whatever mechanism. And have you had an occasion to see hundreds of children that have had traumatic injuries? Yes. Can you give the jury an understand, understanding, sir, of your primary purpose and your function as a physician in pediatric critical care? Um, we have assigned duties at the pediatric ICU. Um, I am the physician who oversees the care of all the children in the ICU, and I'm assisted by specially trained nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners, superb um, uh, backgrounds. And also, uh, repeat with us, our people, uh, physicians and other medical professionals in training will also assist us in the care of these patients. And doctor, was that a simple way of putting that you worked on a critical care team that yes. with each individual patient? Yeah, there is a team taking care of all these patients, of each patient. Dr. Saladino, are you board certified in pediatric critical care? Yes, I've been board certified in pediatric critical care medicine since 2001. And are you also board certified in general practice in pediatrics? Yes, I have been board certified in pediatrics since 1994. Can you give the jury what, what entails becoming board certified? Uh, first of all, you have to go through uh, what we call an accredited training. Um, and then um, after you will go through that and, and you, you, are, you become eligible to take the boards and you sit for the board that is usually about two days and after submitting all of the requirements, uh, the uh, respective boards uh, grant you a certification uh, recognizing that you have had adequate uh, training experience and practice as such. And have you been continuously board, board certified since you first became such? Yes, um, each individual board has its own uh, requirements to maintain certification which include um, keeping up to date in your medical knowledge. Now, who is your employer, Dr. Salahino? I work for the uh, University of Florida College of Medicine here in Jacksonville. 
All right. And will you explain if you if, if true how you are serviced and or contracted also through Wilson's Children's Hospital? Wilson Stones Hospital is under the umbrella of Baptist Health and um, University of Florida Department of Pediatrics um, provides um, contracted services to the Children's Hospital in many fields and one of them is the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. And have you had uh, the occasion of many times to work uh, and, and provide services through Wilson Children's Hospital? Yes. Well, That's, yes, I'm sorry, that we where I work exclusively. Okay. But your employer is UF Health? Yes. Now, I'm shifting gears a little bit and still talking about uh, your background. Doctor, do you also train others, teach others in any capacity? And if so, explain that to the group. Yes. Um, uh, being under the University of Florida, I also hold a faculty position at the level of assistant professor, and that um, part of my duties include uh, taking um, medical students and uh, trainees, uh, doctor trainees, under my supervision so they are. Uh, in, they learn uh, basically the, the trade. And is that something that you do on an ongoing basis? That is an ongoing basis, yes. Yes, sir. And how long have you been doing uh, teaching in that capacity? Um, I have for the University of Florida since September 2001. Now, are you also a member of any professional associations or groups, sir? Yes, um, I am a um, member of the American uh, um, Association of Pediatrics, AAP. And I also hold a membership in the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Thank you, Doctor. Can you give, give the jury an idea of how many times uh, that you testified in, in court as an expert in the field of pediatric critical care and or pediatrics? Uh, beyond numerous depositions, um, I have been in court at least three other times for um, in the testimony of patients who were injured. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> And again, just to reiterate, have you also dealt with pediatric critical care patients where the cause of injuries to them previously was blunt force trauma? Yes. Your Honor, this time attended uh, Dr. Salvatino as an expert in the field of pediatric critical care. Mr. Crowley, you wish to have one after? No question, Judge. Right, you may continue. Thank you, and thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Salvatino, I now want to direct your attention uh, to why you're here today and talk to you about your care and eventual death of Zyperia Robinson on October 18, 2018 through the afternoon of October 19 of 2018. Dr. Salahino, on that first day of October 18, were you the on-duty pediatric physician at Children's Wilson's Hospital that morning? Yes, I am. I was. And did you arrive at the hospital that morning? Yes, that morning I assumed the post as the um, uh, attending, attending physician, the ICU physician on duty. And did you learn that a, pa a young child, a patient, had recently arrived via the emergency room via rescue transport uh, just prior to you coming on duty? Yes. Was she initially taken to the emergency room in the hospital? Yes. And did you learn that uh, at, at the ER that she was at least somewhat stabilized enough for her to be taken out to the P? The PIC, the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. Yes, the uh, emergency department did a, a lot of um, stabilization and interventions to stabilize the care unit before she was transferred to my care, yes. All right. On October 18 of 2018, in the early morning hours, did you assume care for Zyperia Robinson? Yes. Does that in PQ? Yes. All right. And was that also, as you described previously, part of uh, a critical care team? Yes. Uh, as such, doctor, uh, when she arrived in the PQ, did you have access to not only uh, the patient herself, but any and all records affiliated with her care upon arrival? Yes, um, I was given first-hand information by the uh, treating physician in the emergency department, and I also um, looked at uh, existing laboratory tests and uh, images done by the X-ray department. All right. Um, was your care from the morning of October 18th until the afternoon of October 19, 2018? Yes. Uh, at the time where she was pronounced deceased? Yes. All right. And we'll talk about that. And I want to make, maintain, at this point, uh, the focus over about that 24-hour period of your care. Have you had a chance, doctor, prior to coming to court today to review 
uh, the hospital file, uh, photographs, child protection team photographs, any charts, any CT scans, any and all data regarding the care you and your team provided to Zykeria Robinson on those two dates. Yes, I had a chance to do so. <clears throat> now, can you give the jury uh, your initial impression when you first saw the child in the PU? Yes, um, going back to the first day, my focus obviously was to uh, take care of the patient. And um, she came up, she had been reported to us as having had a period of cardiac arrest. So uh, our initial focus was directed towards maintaining the stabilization of her vital signs. And um, after which we, we, we tried to uh, find out what happened so we can better decide a plan of action. Yes, sir. Um, would you give the jury sort of a description of the initial condition when you uh, assume care of the patient? When um, Zakaria came up to the pediatric ICU, um, I immediately saw a child who was not responsive to her surroundings. She was comatose. She had no purposeful movement, meaning her. she did not move her arms or legs to any stimulation. She was not breathing uh, on her own, and um, her pupils were um, fixed and dilated, and she had um, marks in her body. All right, let's talk a little bit about that, break that up. Doctor, when you saw her, was she in extremely critical condition? Yes. Was she in a grave situation? Sir? She, she is. She was, yes. And you mentioned one of the initial impressions was she was in cardiac arrest upon arrival. Just so our jury's clear, what does that mean? Um, so what that means is the heart was not beating when she was brought to the emergency department. And the emergency department uh, made efforts to make the heart beat again. That included giving multiple medications and starting her own uh, medications in, a, in, a, in an infusion to maintain blood pressure and heart rate. And upon arrival in the PICU, did she have a heart rate? Yes, she already had by that time, yes. And had her blood pressure somewhat stabilized by the time you received it? Yeah, there was a blood pressure that was um, um, adequate for her circulation, but it was maintained by medications. All right. Sir, was she comatose? Yes, she was comatose. And will you describe to the jury what that means? And comatose um, is, means that the, uh, any patient that is not responsive uh, to her surroundings, and that's exactly what happened to what I saw with Zakaria. She was just laying there, not moving, um, and absolutely no response to her surroundings and any stimulation. And I think you mentioned her pupils, and you mentioned they were fixed and dilated. Can you explain why that's a concern to you? So uh, pupils, but, uh, move, dilate, or constrict um, as, a, um, as a brain function. And when we see uh, fixed and dilated pupils, uh, that is very concerning because that uh, indicates that brain function has been affected to a significant or profound degree that all control of the um, uh, pupillary actions are gone. Was that concerning to you? Very concerning. Now, when you say she wasn't responsive, did she have any type of reflex action, anything that stimulated either her arms or eyes or the fluttering of her eyes, anything of that nature, sir? Nothing, and uh, just to build on that, um, Mr. Skinner, I, um, one of the things we do is we um, move the breathing tube to see if she would gag and cough, and she had no response. And we uh, press um, certain parts of her body to see if she would withdraw um, or, or pull back her arms or legs and there was no response. At any point in time, Dr. Saladino, did she ever regain any type of uh, reactionary movement in any way whatsoever? Never did. Now you mentioned uh, moving the tube. Was she, the entire time you had her under your care, sir, was she on life support? Yes. Does that mean she was on a ventilator or respirator? Yeah, she was on a respirator or ventilator, as we call it in our uh, field of practice. And does that indicate that she had the inability to breathe on her own in any way whatsoever? That is correct. <clears throat> now, was testing being done on her, certainly on that first day of October 18, 2018? 
Yes, uh, testing for function and reaction to our surroundings were being done on a regular basis, at least every hour, to see if there's any recovery. Now, I want to focus regarding some tests, uh, what, what I call CT scans. Will you first explain to the jury what is a CT scan? So a CT scan is um, a device that is used to take multiple pictures of the brain using x-rays and the computer puts them all, compiles them together in a series of images that allows us to look at uh, the brain and other structures uh, in, in three dimensions. And were you observing those as they were coming in that morning? Yes. As well as your team? Yes, right. all of us did. Yes, sir. When you summarize for the jury what those CT scans were showing you? Yeah, as I recall, by the time we got Rizik here in her care, her brain had significant swelling and there was some uh, bleeding, which we call subdural hematoma. Okay. And were you able to tell on the CT scans initially, just from the CT scans, whether uh, it was in multiple areas on her brain? Yes. Were you able to even pinpoint how many areas on the brain or can a CT scan do that? Um, I, um, it's really diffuse, so it's not like just one point. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Well, you just define for a very diffuse, D-I-F-F-U-S-E. -F -F -E. Yeah, it means that the bleeding was around the brain, surrounding the brain, and not just one particular area. And the swelling was also whole brain involved. Tell the jury why swelling is a major concern to you with this five-year-old child. Yes, any swelling of the brain um, is very serious and critical because that means that the brain is becoming uh, very tight under, within the skull and that creates uh, problems with eventual blood flow to the rest of the brain if it hasn't happened already. And does that potentially lead to her demise? Yes, that will eventually lead to a, a loss of, a complete loss of all brain functions or brain death. Yes, sir. Now, you also mentioned, I think you looked at her eyes, and I think your initial impressions were they were fixed and dilated. Did you notice any, any bleeding, either behind her eyes, upon her eyes, within her eyes, anything of that nature? Yes. So uh, when she arrived, her pupils were very dilated, so you could actually look into the pupils, into the back of her eyes, and you could see blood spots or hemorrhages behind her eyes. Is that Inside her eyes, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Is that concerning? Yes. That uh, means that, um, that you only see that in severe high impact uh, injuries. And when you say severe high impact injuries, would that include blunt force trauma? Yes. Now, I think lastly, regarding your initial observations, you also noticed some external uh, injuries about her person. Can you sort of summarize, if you can, uh, what you saw that morning, sir? Yes. Um, um, when we examined the Zakaria on her right, uh, after we ascertained that she was stable enough, we took an account of what we could see in examination. And there were um, multiple um, areas of abraded skin, um, which means skin uh, surface has been um, scraped away. There were some underlying um, wounds and points of bleeding. Some of them were old, some of them appeared newer. And there was also patterns uh, on, the, on, on several parts of the body that were uh, um, kind of also showed that there were wounds there that were kind of old and new. And were these on multiple areas about a person? Yes. Um, I, I remember seeing some of them like under the armpit, and her, her left or right side, and definitely in the mm -hmm. legs and the feet, and also in our buttocks or her behind. Yes, sir. We'll look at a few photos in a minute. Just so so as not to keep them up long, I just want to walk through your testimony yes. a little bit first and then we'll look at some of those. Yes. Um, <clears throat> once you had all of these initial impressions and the testing, the CT testing was being done, um, you're monitoring her brain, her heart, she was intubated, um, did you make any initial determinations about whether she was potentially eligible to survive this doctor? Yeah, based on uh, the um, history or story I got from the response from the initial care providers that she had a protracted or a long duration of her heart not beating and a heart as swollen as it is, I knew right away that this is not survivable. Yes, sir. And that 
was an impression in your mind on the first day of her On the very first day, yes. Did that prompt your, you and your team, Dr. Salahino, to keep her on life support? Yes. At any point on the 18th, was there any improvement whatsoever in those conditions? No. Moving to her second day at Wolfson's Children's Hospital, was there any improvement of her condition in any way whatsoever on October 19, 2018? No, nothing at all. No improvement. On day two, doctor, did that prompt you and your team to do uh, further testing to determine whether she was in fact going to get? Um, that is correct. But the second day when we noted that she had not improved, we went to the um, um, to the point where we wanted to determine whether she was already done. We have brain that determination as part of that. Yes, sir. And is brain um, dead or death determination testing done by U.S. physicians to make that? Decision. Yes, along with, I believe, a neurologist from her birth. Can you um, give the jury an indication of what's done during that brain dead determination, how it's done by independent doctors, explain that for our Yes. So the process of brain death uh, determination is very uh, standardized uh, so that uh, we are sure that the child, that any patient is gone. So it, it first starts by Determining that uh, the patient is comatose because of some mechanism that, in some evidence, that the brain was quite injured in. And in that, uh, looking at a CT scan showing significant brain swelling in the bleeding allowed us to go beyond that step. And then what follows next is I, along with another uh, separate uh, physician, do independent examinations, um, determining if there's any function of the brain whatsoever. And then um, the, the examinations are directed towards looking for any remaining function of the brain, whether it's there or it's not. Are these tests commonly referred to as either the ancillary test and or the apnea, A-P-N-E-A -E test? Yes, those two tests are certainly part of the uh, process, uh, uh, but before we go to doing the uh, apnea tests and, and the ancillary tests, we examine uh, the patient first if to see a, if there's indeed coma or no function to her surroundings. And we also look for other uh, functions of the parts of the brain, including uh, inability to breathe on their own. Um, if the pupils remain fixed and dilated, we also look for gagging and coughing, which are reflexes served by the parts of the brain. And then we move on trying to see if the child will breathe on her own if she was challenged. And the ancillary test is done uh, to complement those examinations if needed. Was there an attempt to see if she had any ability whatsoever to breathe on her own? No, because of her, in, uh, well, you know, we have stabilized her, but at great, um, um, at a great level of um, support, uh, which included medication support, her blood pressure, etc. And the apnea, uh, the, the test that we do to see if she could breathe on her own requires that we disconnect her from the respirator for a brief period of time. Uh, and then challenge her to see if she would breathe. We felt at that time she was too unstable to do that, that we decided to do other tests to evaluate for brain uh, function. Yes, sir. And do the other tests that you did conduct, is that where you're shooting the dye to see if there's any blood, fro blood flow into her brain? Yes, sir, and that is what we call a, a nuclear brain flow study. And how that's done is that um, uh, uh, the, the patient was injected with a uh, substance that shows up in a uh, special x-ray machine, uh, a tracer, if you will, and, and after allowing some time for it to circulate through the body, um, the special machine picks up if there's any brain, uh, blood flow to the brain um, to see if um, there is any blood flow to, to the brain, and that would be the, the test. Yes, sir. And once you conducted this test, um, did the nuclear medicine brain flow study show any flow of blood whatsoever to her brain? The official reading said no, there was no blood flow to the brain. I actually saw the images, there was no blood flow to the brain. Yes, sir. Now, after that testing and after all the observations that she testified about, did you therefore, you um, yourself, declare her to have absolute zero function? Yes, she had um, no function at all. And so, sir, did you declare her brain dead? 
Yes, after the um, completion of two examinations in the nuclear brain flow study, I had enough information to, from, to pronounce her deceased the following day, a little after one o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, October 19th. October 19th, yes. That's right. Now, briefly, doctor, I know after you declared her brain dead, uh, was she removed from life support? Just give the jury a summary of why not and what happened to her. So, um, Every time we, um, there's a situation where you declare brain death, um, we um, then approach the family, uh, introduce them to uh, some other individuals uh, to discuss the prospect of donating our organs. And at that point, we um, let uh, our organ procurement uh, folks called uh, LifeQuest to come in and speak with the family. Was that on uh, this particular case? Yes, they were. In, uh, they were brought in and they spoke with the mother. Yes, sir. Was she thereafter removed from under your care and placed under the care of LifeQuest for organ donation? Yes. And was that done after you, you pronounced her on 104 p.m. on October 19th? Yes. Now, Doctor, we're just going to walk through a few of the photographs of how you saw her. Um, have, you, have you had a chance to uh, review each and every one of these prior to coming to court today? Yes, I, I did have a chance, and um, I brought back a lot of memories too. Yes, sir. And do each of these photographs fairly and accurately depict Zachariah Robinson on the two days of your care of her? Uh, yes. Um, there are no pictures yet, but yes, the ones that I've seen. Yes. Okay. Should turn to just a second. Okay, I'm now showing you what's been marked the state's exhibit 112. Members of the jury, do you have photos on your screen? Yes. Okay. There you can. So, just a few of these doctors, if you would just explain, I'm first showing you what's been marked the state's exhibit 112. Is that the left arm of Zycheria Robinson? Yes, that is the left arm. And can you just, if you would, kind of, you can touch your screen and circle it, uh, point out what injuries we see here. Okay. Um, I can see here, I can certainly right here, that seems to be a bruise on the left side of her chest. And this particular image was very um, uh, distinct. And at that time, as I documented in my note, I, I thought that they looked like bite marks. Yes, sir. Do we see that in a semi-circular pattern? Yes, that's how I described it in my notes. I now show you what's been marked the state's exhibit 113, that's 113. What do we see on this on Zycheria Robinson's right arm? Yes, and I will encircle that, and that also is consistent with my documentation of what I thought were bite marks. Sorry. I now show you what's been marked the state's exhibit 114. Of what do we see that she can tell on that, sir? Yes, and uh, this is uh, another uh, one thing pattern that I documented in my note, which I thought looked like white marks. You mentioned the term <coughs> of braided skin, A B R A D E D. What is a braided skin? Yeah, a braid, a braided skin means means that the top layer of the skin had been removed, either peeled off or uh, or broken with whatever uh, mechanism. Now showing you what's been marked in States Exhibit 115. What do we see there, sir? Um, these are pump wet, you know, I call pump wet meaning they look like small puncture wounds that are have clots in them. So um, and they seem to be in a semicircular pattern too, and I thought they this may get you know like bite marks that seem to be more recent than the others. Yes, sir. The the, the difference in coloration of each of these injuries we're looking at, is that why you're opining that these injuries were over different time periods? Yes. I'm now showing you what's been marked the State's Exhibit 116. What do we see there, sir? Hey, take your time. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Just coming back in. Sorry. Yes, sir. Take your time. So, um, We, we thought it was going to say, uh, 
all the way to 70% turbines. Okay. Would, would this be uh, something that would, in common term vote, be bruising to her last side, sir? Yes. All right, <clears throat> I now show you what's been marked in states exhibit 117. What do we see there with respect to the eyes? What kind of injuries do we see there, sir? Um, and I can vaguely see some bruising about uh, the left eye and then in its circle. Uh, the rest of our head have been covered uh, with a dressing because we applied a EEG brainwave um, determination to see if there are any ongoing seizures that we need to treat. And you mentioned the term earlier, intubated. Is this the machine that we see through her mouth and yes. her nose that helps her to breathe? Yeah, this is a uh, breathing tube that goes through her nose into her breathing passages um, so that we can allow her to uh, breathe, breathe and bring in oxygen and carbon dioxide out uh, to her body and carbon dioxide out of her body. Yes, sir. <clears throat> what do we see in stage 118, sir? And uh, I believe this is the knee. And this is another picture of um, injuries that appear more recent uh, than the other marks on our body. And how about 119? And these are also another um, other areas of peeling for the skin or abrasions that appear to be of um, um, less recent than the others. Yes, sir. And is that why you applied an earlier uh, many of the injuries you see about her externally are over a certain time period. Yes. All this didn't happen at one time, right, sir? As far as I can tell, yes. yes sir. We see the name uh, photographed by Dr. Andrews. Who was that? Is that a member of your team? Dr. Andrews, if I remember correctly, that being a common name, I believe she was a physician in training with the child protection team at that time. All right. <clears throat> Doctor, what do we see in stage 121? And um, I see a discoloration of the thigh there that we thought represented uh, bruising. Yes, sir. How about stage 122? And then uh, this is another area of what we call a braided skin. And you can see that the top here of the skin was peeled here, peeled back. And then there's an area here that is also abraded in some um, redness underneath that, which shows blood just underneath this area of the skin. Collectively, doctors, does this look? Does this appear to be normal lumps and bruises for a five-year-old? No. And stage one twenty-three. Just a few more, doctor. And we'll move on. Yes. And uh, these are again uh, marks in the body that. Um, reflect injuries that have been uh, or are in you know wounds that have happened less recently. Stage 124. And again this is um, shows also some bruising and also here I put that put an arrow but appear to be like upper, again abraded skin. That's right. And 125. And um, I will point out, of course, also this is an area of uh, like an, an old abrasion that is starting to heal up. And 126. Um, this one, a um, little purplish area that looks like it's a bruise. Dr. Dr. Gully will be here tomorrow to kind of walk through more of these. I, I, I want to ask you did you find uh, these types of injuries throughout? Um, or most of her external body. Yes. <clears throat> Doctor, after you uh, conducted your brain examination, the brain dead examination, after you saw the CT scans, after you pronounced this child, uh, was there a time period during your, your, your care of this child that you called in what's known to be the child protection team? Yes, um, at any time we suspect that uh, injuries to the child uh, were inflicted rather than accidental, uh, we call uh, protective services and it includes the child protection team. Is the medical director for that team Dr. Kathleen Dunn? Yes. And did you meet with her and consult with her during the care of this child as well? Yes. 
Did you do that, sir, after everything that you saw and all the testing that you, you were directing because you were concerned that this child was uh, suspected of being physically abused? Yes. Did you make a determination whether these injuries, in your opinion, whether they were accidental or non accidental? They were non accidental. And was the CT scans that you showed uh, the results up to you? Did you make the determination that that was caused by law enforcement trauma that was severe? Yes. Are those the reasons that you called in Dr. Belly and Child Protection Team? Yes. One more, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Your Honor, nothing further. Okay. All right. Doctor, you just testified that you made the determination that these injuries were not accidental, is that right? Yes. Now, and I don't want to quibble with you over individual injuries, and I'm not going to quibble with you over that, in fact, your opinion is correct, but you can't say to any degree of medical certainty that every single one of those injuries is not accidental, can you? Yes. You, you, it's not possible a child could have fell and scraped your knee? Um, some of those injuries, yes, they may appear that they could have been due uh, to a normal child's activity, some of them. Now, um, Doctor, another thing is, again, I'm not quibbling with you um, over these injuries. They clearly prompted you probably right away to know that you needed to call the CPT, right? Yes. Um, but you can't tell us based on your observations who actually looked at those injuries. Can you? No. You did, in the course of determining a treatment care plan for this child, go and speak to the child's parents, correct? Uh, the mother, and I believe the other person was not the father, but the, uh, somebody who was the uh, mother's partner. All right, and to go back, you came on duty at 7 a.m. on October 18th? Yes. And the doctor, the child had already been treated by JFRD and brought to the hospital? Uh, JFRD, then by our emergency department, then not to me, yes. Then you. And so um, you go and meet with the mother shortly after 0700 that morning? Um, I don't know exactly the time, but I met both her and uh, the mother's appointment. And one of the reasons for doing that was to take a medical history from the mother? Yes. And in taking that history was important for your care of the child? Absolutely. And you documented this maternal reporting in your notes very articulately, didn't you? Yes. And when you took that history from the mother, you mentioned that there was the mother's paramour there, or who, who you believe was the mother's paramour. There was also a police officer standing nearby. Yes, at that time. And the mother gave you a rundown of the child's medical conditions and history that led to her being in the hospital that morning. Yes. And the mother told you that the child had been suffering a five-day history of a mild cough? Yes. The mother told you that she had administered flu medication? Um, some medication that she thought was for, the, for her respiratory tract infection, but she did not specify what it was. What it was. And when you say flu medicine, to me that's very specific, and she wasn't that specific. The mother told you that the child had remained without associated fever, shortness of breath, lethargy, abdominal pain, vomiting, or a decrease in appetite. Yes. And that's from the mother. Yes. The mother also told you uh, that Zakaria was acting per her usual self yesterday evening and ended up falling asleep on the couch while watching TV. Yes. The mother um, told you that she had actually given the child medication around 10.30 p.m. the night before. Um, if my record reflect that, yes. The mom described to you that early in the morning the child had walked to the bathroom alone, at which time she proceeded to hear a loud fall and rushed into the bathroom to find the child submerged and unconscious. Yes. The mother told you that she immediately called 911 and was instructed to initiate chest compressions. Yes. And uh, throughout your note that you said you reviewed before you came here today, uh, you repeatedly wrote maternal reporting, mom knows, mom states. You did that because you're indicating that that's the information that you're actually getting from the mother. Yes, and at that time, the uh, boyfriend was also there, so I was looking to him too for any, um, um, any additional information. But most of the information, yes, was coming from the mother. And you didn't note in your report that, that 
the, the husband or the pair more provided you any information like that, did you? Um, not in my note, but checking when he was there. Doctor, you also talked with the state about your efforts to essentially get the child to react. You talked about physical movements of the child and moving the, the breathing tube, is that correct? Among other things, yes. And, and among those other things is a sternum rub, correct? Um, yes. Okay. And that's a common thing for any type of medical professional to do to try and get a reaction out of an unconscious patient. Yes. Now the child was declared, uh, I believe you said the child was declared dead on October 19th at approximately 1 p.m.? Uh, shortly thereafter, yes. Shortly thereafter, okay. And that's when the, um, you sort of started the process as to whether or not this would be a case where the organs could be harvested? Only after brain death, yes. Right. And um, you talked about LifeQuest. Um, prior to any type of organ harvesting, um, there's certain tests that have to be run on, on the individual, correct? Before the organs are retrieved? Yes. And one of those um, is, and the reason for that is that in order to donate organs, um, the organs have to be in good condition when they're taken. Yes. Otherwise, there's no point in taking them, correct? Yes. And so as part of that, you actually ordered a CT scan before the organ harvesting began. The CT scan was um, done earlier in her, uh, on her, you were talking about the CT scan of the head, right? right? No, doctor, I'm talking about a CT scan performed on October 20th of 2018 at 1417 that was ordered by you for the CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis without contrast. Okay, so um, that was ha that happened after the child was declared yes. deceased. Yes. Before the organ harvesting Yes, and I do not remember the circumstances of that. That may be part of the workup, yes. All right. Um, and again, the reason for that is to make sure that the organs are in good condition. Um, or they're taken. I must admit, at that time, after the child was declared deceased, uh, those CT scans were done at the uh, behest or the request of the organ donation people. And my name is placed there for nominal first purposes because I had been taking care of her. So the reasons for doing those CT scans, the specific reasons are, uh, are, are, are best answered by them, but in general, yes, those CT scans are done to look at the integrity of organ function. So even though your name is on here as the ordering provider, you're telling us you didn't order this? It is ordered to, by one of us under my name so that we can help the organ procurement people after the family has given permission for the organs to be donated, yes. Okay, well, I'll just ask you the question, doctor. Do you remember the radiology reports for Zycheria, both pre-mortem and post-mortem, meaning you know, after she was declared death, for the organ harvesting showed no damage to her kidneys? Um, I'm not aware of the CT scan. As I said, those CT scans after she was declared deceased were done at the request of the organ donation team. How about the pre-mortem scan of her abdomen? Do you remember that coming back and saying there was no damage to her kidneys? Uh, I don't remember that. I concentrated on the uh, injuries to her head and the body. Yes. So is it your testimony that you never would have reviewed the uh, CT results from her abdomen? Um, in defining the reason for her death, um, I did not because I, as I mentioned, this patient came in, or she came in with um, evidence of uh, multiple um, injuries to her body and, and cardiac arrest and signs of uh, injury to her brain. But you would agree with me that an organ donation team would not take an organ that, that had been shown to be damaged on top. Oh, yes. Yes. Dr. Yu, um, testified about a lot of the injuries that you observed, some are more recent than others, is that yes. correct? Yes, yes. you agree with me that there's no scientific or medical way to actually date exactly when the injuries occur, other than to say some are newer or fresher than others? Yes. Now, the child was kept on life support until October 21st of 2018, is that correct? Um, 
Until the time where her organs were removed for donation, yes. And it, when a child is kept on life support, blood is still flowing, the body is still breathing, in fact, the body can continue to change. Um, I don't know exactly what you're asking. Um, when you say begin, sorry, what do you mean by change? The body, the body's function, the body continues to function as a body. That is correct. One moment, Your Honor. Yes, sir. No further questions, Your Honor. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. May be seated. Welcome back. This is the jury. Uh, we're ready to proceed with the trial. Mr. Skinner, go ahead and ask Thank you very much, Your Honor. Dr. Karen and Shimshak. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall have to go? I do. I do. How long have you been an ophthalmologist, a pediatric ophthalmologist in your career? Uh, since 1990. So approximately 34 years? Yes. Now, can you um, give our jury an understanding of your duties as um, a pediatric ophthalmologist? As a pediatric ophthalmologist, we are responsible for um, the comprehensive health of uh, the eyes from newborn age uh, on upward, um, including systemic diseases and ocular health and ocular diseases, genetic eye diseases, <coughs> responsible for on-call, and responsible for on-call responsibility. Great, thank you. And currently, are you a duly licensed physician here in the state of Florida? Yes. And for how long? Since uh, 2015. All right. Are you also a duly licensed physician in other states? Yes. I do need yes. To also. Yes. Uh, currently in Montana as well, and I have been in multiple other states. Does that include Wisconsin, Indiana, Kansas, Missouri, Ohio, and Maryland? Yes. <clears throat> Are you currently engaged today as you testify in current practice of your Yes. On a day-to-day -day basis, I think you mentioned you're employed at the Mayo Clinic. Yes. In, in October of 2018, where were you working? I was uh, full-time with Memorials. Is that here in Jackson? Yes. So the Children's Wolf. The Children's Health, yes. <clears throat> now, Dr. Shipshack, if you would, would you walk the jury uh, briefly through your education and training um, in preparation for your career? After four years of medical school, um, a, I took a four-year residency in ophthalmology with one-year fellowship training in pediatric ophthalmology and adult strabismus or eye movement disorders. And did you attend medical school at the College of Wisconsin? Medical College of Wisconsin, yes. Thank you. And did you do your fellowship training at the University of Indiana? Yes, in Indianapolis. Thank you. And in 1990, did you do what's called a preceptorship? And if so, where? 
Yes, that is in ocular genetics at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Thank you, Doctor. Now, shifting gears to the number of patients um, first that you think you either consulted about or treated in the area of ophthalmology, can you give the jury an estimate of the number of patients that you see? Uh, over 30 plus years, many thousands, probably over 15,000 or so, 20,000. Now, when conducting an eye consult or doing an eye examination, can you give the jury an idea of what that entails, just in general? Uh, it, as a eye examination, uh, we're responsible for examining the health of the eye from the area surrounding the eye uh, to the eye ball, or we call it the globe. Uh, inside and out uh, with its connection to the brain via the optic nerve. And have you done eye exams and or eye consults for every age patient, from infant to all the way to an even an elderly patient? Yes, from uh, newborns, premature babies through elderly patients. All right. Have you also had, uh, in your career, uh, done consults or eye exams for patients in the, in the age group of uh, zero to let's say six years of age. Yes, many. Would that be in the thousands? In the thousands? <laughs> yes, that's the bulk of my career. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> now, do you specialize in any particular branch specifically related to your field? A pediatric ophthalmology and adult eye muscle movement disorders. Okay. And does that a part of your practice generally entail younger patients with that more? Yes, that's the pediatric ophthalmology portion, okay. which is what I practice with at Memoirs. Thank you, Doctor. Now, you explained to the jury, we heard a little bit about board certification through Dr. Salahino. Are you also board certified in the field of pediatric ophthalmology? We're board certified in ophthalmology by the American Board of uh, Ophthalmology. And then as a fellowship trained board certified ophthalmologist, we are members of the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Mr. Business. There's no separate board certification per se. Great, thank you for that. And can you tell us how long you have been board certified in ophthalmology? Since 1990. Would that be approximately 34 years? Yes. Now to be board certified in the area of ophthalmology, what does that entail? Uh, you complete your residency uh, training and uh, have a series of written uh, examinations over that period as well as an oral examination in person uh, through the uh, American Board of Ophthalmology. Does being board certified also require ongoing education and or examinations? Yes, we're required to have um, continuing medical education credits each year to maintain uh, State licensure. And as you testify here today, uh, Dr. Shimshek, are you have you maintained that? Yes. Right. <clears throat> now, when you go back to um, October of 2018 and, and first tell us how you came to Children's Memorial Clinic. Where were you prior to that? Um, prior to that, I was working uh, with Nemours in Orlando um, from 2016 to 2018. Uh, and then I was recruited for the uh, position of division chief uh, here at uh, the Morris Children's Health in Jacksonville in 2018. And does division chief mean that you're supervising others? Yes. And approximately how many? We had uh, five ophthalmologists and two optometrists in our division. And did you do that for a term of years? Three years. Okay. And then at the end of that three-year period, where did you go uh, for your next employment? Uh, after that period, I then uh, went to Mayo Clinic and am working in the area of adult eye movement disorders. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> now, in terms of not just simply your um, division chief capacity when you were at Children's Wilson's Hospital, do you, in your career at any time, have you trained others in other physicians 
uh, and or fellows in the area of ophthalmology? Yes, I've been involved with uh, teaching fellow ophthalmologists, residents, medical students, um, done lectures uh, for continuing medical education for uh, other areas outside of ophthalmology and spoken at um, regional and national conferences for um, on different topics within pediatric ophthalmology. Thank you, ma'am. And as a member, uh, or are you a member of any professional organizations, professional groups uh, within your area of practice, and if so, why? Uh, yes, the American Associ American Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, and the American Board of Ophthalmology. Thank you, Doctor. And if you would briefly just tell our jury approximately how many times that you testified in, as an expert in the field of pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, I testified as uh, an examining fact witness not a paid expert witness about three or four times. Thank you. And so on each of those other three or four times, there, you were actually uh, the physician, the ophthalmologist for that patient. The examining physician, yes. As is the uh, as as is what's, what you're about to testify to. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> were those other um, four instances, three or four instances in Florida, Kansas City, Wisconsin, Cincinnati? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, I would tender uh, Dr. Shimshak as an expert in the field of pediatric ophthalmology. Any questions or for an eye, Mr. Crowe? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may continue. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Doctor, I now want to direct your attention mm -hmm. uh, back to the case that you're here to testify about today. That, that is involving a patient by the name of Zykeria Robinson and your care of her briefly on October 18 of 2018. Do you recall your care of her in that case? Yes. In this case, okay. Um, were you working that particular day at Children's Wilson's Hospital? Yes, I was the on-call physician uh, that week. All right. Did you learn that this patient, Zakiria Robinson, had recently arrived uh, through the ER that morning uh, when you were coming on duty as an on-call physician? A consultation request was placed for um, uh, ophthalmic examination based upon her coming in through the emergency room and then to the ICU. Okay. Explain to the jury as, as how are you summoned to that particular care of that particular patient to the normal, the normal course of your work? Uh, we're paged with a consultation request based upon um, the nature of the issue with the child as they come in through the emergency room or in the ICU. And have you um, been paged in that capacity hundreds of times in your career? Yes. Right. On this particular day, when you paged by a critical care team at Wilson's Children, Children's Hospital, that Dr. Sally Haino was also uh, uh, part of that team. Yes, that, that consultation request initiated from the trauma team, or the ICU team. All right. And did you see Zykeria Robinson that afternoon between the 4 p.m. and the 5 p.m.? Yes. And was that for purposes of doing this um, consultation of her as part of the multidisciplinary team, the trauma team there at Wilson's? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Will you uh, first give the jury an idea before we talk about her, what, what you do during a consultation with a child of that age in this circumstance? What are you about to do? Uh, we are, uh, the consultation is requested again based upon the presenting findings um, of the, the child we were asked to assess her for evidence of retinal hemorrhage eye trauma related to her associated uh, presenting findings and that entails a uh, comprehensive eye examination from the area around the eyes uh, to the outside of the eye, to the inside of the eye, from the front to the back. Um, All right, thank you for that. Now, when you uh, first start seeing the child, evaluating the child, had you learned of any information, like for example, from her CT scans, what they were showing that day? Yes, there were other um, <coughs> presenting uh, findings that warranted the consultation request to assess for uh, retinal hemorrhages, 
um, as a um, child abuse suspect, non-accidental trauma, um, as we call it, given the fact that there were um, cerebral hemorrhages, a subdural hemorrhage that had uh, presented on the uh, CT scan, and she was in a coma uh, when she presented. Yes, ma'am. Now, when a patient that young presents with a subdural hematoma that was showing on those CT scans, is that somebody that you would expect to find retinal hemorrhaging in both eyes? That the subdural uh, hemorrhage has a high association uh, with retinal hemorrhages and thus the classification of non-accidental trauma or suspected abusive head trauma. In general, does retinal hemorrhaging general is it generally caused by blunt force trauma or force or shaken baby syndrome or anything of the sort? Yes, the retinal hemorrhage is, is a result of trauma to the head, uh, which can occur um, with a back and forth movement of the head. It requires a firm, uh, severe. Uh, shaking movement of the head, hence the term shaken baby syndrome, it used to be called in the new terminology, is abusive head trauma or non-accidental trauma. Right. Can it also be caused, just in general, generally speaking, can it also be caused with something hard hitting a child's head or the child's head hitting something hard? A subdural uh, hemorrhage can occur in the setting of uh, blunt force trauma. However, you would typically uh, may not see the extent of the retinal hemorrhaging um, that was noted in this patient it requires more severe uh, force. Okay, and we'll get to her in just a moment. So, so, so we're clear, and our jury's clear. Is it your testimony then as an expert in this field that the more severe of, of the sort of the brain hitting the inside of the skull multiple times, is that what causes the retinal hemorrhage? There's a back and the back and forth movement of the head causes what we call shearing or contra coup uh, force, um, which causes tearing of the fine blood vessels um, in and around the eyes and um, tearing of the retina potentially itself and that causes bleeding um, into the eye and in different layers of the retina. And so we are asked to assess for retinal hemorrhages accordingly. If you see retinal hemorrhaging again, just generally speaking, in multiple layers of the retina, does that mean the force is more severe? The force being the um, back and forth uh, abusive head trauma uh, noted with the retinal hemorrhaging that occurs as reported um, in the consultation report where you see it um, extensively throughout the retina. All layers of the retina, um, we have a, a picture we can show um, from the outer peripheral border of the retina back to the optic nerve, um, and there's different sizes and shapes of hemorrhages that are noted, and you can also um, date the hemorrhages um, to some degree, new and old. Great, and we'll talk about that when we get to her evaluation. <clears throat> when you first saw uh, Zykeria Robinson, did you externally evaluate and examine her eyes? Yes, there was noted to be some bruising uh, on the, I believe it's the right temple and along the left eye. Okay. And that's externally. That was, externally. That has nothing that to do with the eyeballs. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> now, when you give, uh, turning now to the internal part of your eyes and into the retina uh, and the optic nerve that you're talking about, how is it that you're able to observe? what you're about to testify, we'll look at pictures up in a second, but how is it, how is that conducted, how is that examination done? We may have to use eye drops to dilate the pupil, but her pupils were already fixed and dilated related to her severe uh, injury, brain injury. Um, and um, we have an instrument called um, a binocular ophthalmoscope we wear on our head 
um, and a lens in our hand, and then we can look into the eye um, like a telescope or a camera and view all areas of the retina. And when you're doing that examination, are you able to capture that with a photograph of the retina? Yes, after the binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy, as we call it. Um, we use a instrument called a ret cam, which allows us to take photographic evidence um, in addition to our drawings to uh, validate and confirm okay. the findings. Would it benefit our jury for you to talk about sort of the, the layers of the retina uh, that you're about to describe? Um, yes. This. Uh, so let me just put on the record what we're looking at. Man, I'm showing you what's uh, what, what's not been marked because we're using this as a demonstrative aid that we have shown for the defense. Uh, what I would ask you first is just explain to the jury what we see in this label uh, uh, graph of what appears to be the eye. The uh, upper left-hand picture is a uh, cross-sectional view of the eye, uh, showing the front of the eye being at the left with the cornea. The lens of the eye is the oval, um, uh, white, opaque, um, uh, <coughs> translucent, um, back into the vitreous cavity, which is the gel of the inside of the eye. And the retina is the back layer of the eyeball that is covered in blood vessels. And um, the retina is like the film of a camera that allows us to see and connects with the nerve cells through the optic nerve to the brain and the visual pathways in the brain. The retina has um, 10 total layers, this, uh, and they're, these are the different layers of the um, retinal receptors. So if, if I'm clear, let me erase what you circled. I think, well, first of all, for the did you circle the entire eyeball? I circled the entire eyeball. Yes, ma'am. And now, doctor, if you would um, circle the area that you would describe as the retina itself. Well, the retina would be all of these layers as it connects to the outer white uh, membrane of the eye here. Um, but each one of these is considered um, a retinal layer. Um, we have the internal limiting membrane, the um, nerve fiber layer, the gangrene cell layer, and all these other layers. So there can be bleeding that can occur at any one of these levels of the retina. All right, I'll erase your lines. At the top of, of this diagram, there's the word light with three arrows pointing down. Will you, will you describe what that means for our viewers? That is uh, the light or the image that enters into the eye and then uh, is focused on the retina. Again, uh, a, a lens a camera and the light coming into the camera lens and then focusing on the film of the camera or the retina at the back of the eye. Okay, so in colors on this demonstrative aid, the top portion of that first layer, I guess we'll call it the nerve fiber layer, and then the second one down is the ganglion or ganglion cell layer um, that appear to be either yellow or gold in color. Is, is that the first layer of, of the retina that would be receptive to light in the eyeball? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then as you go down on the chart, is that deeper layers? Deeper uh, layers of the retina, and each cell layer has its own function. All right. And at the bottom of that chart of all the layers that you have on the right-hand side, the last entry at the bottom says retinal pigment epithelium. 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 Tell the jury what that is at the very bottom. Uh, that's the layer of the retina that helps um, uh, is a, is a nerve layer and then helps transmit the images from uh, the eye to the brain through the optic nerve. Okay, and still speaking in general, not with respect to Zakiria yet at, at the moment, would you expect to see multiple layers of bleeding, of retinal hemorrhaging at each of these layers in a case where a child suffered blunt force trauma or shaken baby? Yes. That is the description. In the literature, or in your experience, or in your training, in your career, is it uh, you, your testimony that that is a general thrust of the cause of retinal imaging, that is blood force trauma? Uh, 
Yes, a blunt force, abusive head trauma versus just the single incident of head trauma. It has to be repeated um, and kind of back and back and forth is what's characterized as non-accidental or abusive head trauma. Thank you, doctor. So if a child age five would fall and hit her head on the sidewalk or a bathtub one time, would you expect to see the extent of subdural hematoma on multiple layers of moretta? Uh, the subdural hematoma is for the brain, but you would not expect to see uh, a wide distribution of retinal hemorrhaging in a single um, blunt force injury. Okay, so the retinal hemorrhaging that you observe in the eyeball, if it is on multiple layers, is it your testimony? That would be caused by multiple forces, multiple blows, multiple shaking to a child's body. Objection, Your Honor. That's a very compound question. I'll rephrase it right quick. Let break it down. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Doctor, would you expect to see retinal hemorrhaging on multiple layers if a child received blood force trauma, repeated blood force trauma? Yes, with the back and forth movement of the head or the, what we call shaken baby. Okay. And that was my next question, just to make sure I'm clear. Would you also expect to see it with, with the shaken baby type of situation? Yes. Okay. Would you also expect to see it uh, with any multiple force that a child would suffer to its head or movement or any heavy force shaking to a child? Objection, Your Honor. Again, compound question. Ready now. I'll rephrase it. Would you expect to see it with multiple forces to a child's head? Yes, multiple repeated forces to the child's head. Thank you, Doctor. Now, turning to Zykeria herself, Zykeria Robinson, uh, during the hour that you spent with her during this consult, did you conduct the examination that you just described for her? Yes, I did. Did you look and evaluate both retinas in her eye? Yes. Um, as we next kind of shift gears to the results, first let, let's just start with both eyes just in general. Did you find retinal hemorrhaging in both eyes? Yes. Did you find retinal hemorrhaging in multiple layers of both eyes? Yes. <clears throat> now, just starting with the left eye, um, if you would, if you have to, I know you have your report in front of me, if you have to refer to it, no problem. Would you kind of give the jury an idea of how far the left eye retinal hemorrhaging extended in the layers? In the left eye, um, there were scattered bleeding spots um, considered uh, pre-retinal just before the layer of the retina um, around the optic nerve through um, all layers of the retina and from the optic nerve to what we call the periphery or the aura serrata mm -hmm. is the medical term. Um, so they were diffuse widespread through all layers uh, of the retina and at the optic nerve. All right, so if you would, in the demonstrative aid in front of you, let me erase your previous uh, drawing. Would you kind of show the jury the depth of the retinal hemorrhaging that you just described in the left eye? Uh, yes, there were, again, layered, uh, layered hemorrhages um, uh, in, on top of the retina and then intraretinal through all layers, all depths of the retina and then from the outer peripheral area all the way back to the optic nerve. And again, that's the left eye, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Now, Dr. Shimshak, erasing that, would you now tell the jury what you found with respect to the uh, retinal hemorrhaging in her right eye? In the right eye, there were similar scattered um, bleeding spots, pre-retinal and retina, intra-retinal, multiple layers extending from the optic nerve to the periphery um, and of note were older darker lesions that and brighter um, red new blood um, and layered pre-retinal hemorrhage. Okay so with the instrument that you're using you just mentioned uh, the next thing I want to introduce to our jury the older and the newer retinal hemorrhaging. First and foremost, just talk about color. Is the older ret retinal hemorrhaging darker than a newer retinal hemorrhage? Those are older hemorrhages um, and they typically have a white spot or um, dot in the middle, which is an accumulation of white blood cells. That's how you can date uh, the hemorrhages from acute to older. Okay. 
Did you see older retinal hemorrhaging in both eyes? Uh, yes. All right. And does newer retinal hemorrhaging, uh, I think you mentioned the color bright red, is that what you would see if you saw newer retinal hemorrhaging? Yes. Did you see newer retinal hemorrhaging in both eyes? Yes. <clears throat> Now, in terms of dating these, you started to talk about uh, from, from more recent to older. Give us the sort of an estimate or how you're able to do that, and are you able to do it in terms of an hour or a day or a week on those models? The newer, brighter hemorrhages are within uh, a day or two or three, and the older hemorrhages uh, can take time to resorb. It can be from weeks to potentially even a month or so. Uh, it's hard to exactly define or date an older hemorrhage, but the sign that it's an older hemorrhage is that white um, center on the hemorrhage. Yes, ma'am. Now, so our jury's clear. Um, did you see both newer and older retinal hemorrhaging in both Yes. Um, did this child have older retinal hemorrhaging that you are comfortable in testifying to a reasonable medical certainty is at least weeks to months old? Or somewhere? Yes. Are you also comfortable in testifying? No, objection, Your Honor. You didn't give the witness a chance to answer that question. I think she did. Well, um, yeah, I think she did. Go ahead, ask the next question. Is it your testimony, doctor, as an expert to reasonable medical certainty that this child also had a recent retinal hemorrhage? Yes. In both eyes? Right, red blood, yes. Okay. And would, is it your testimony that the recent retinal hemorrhaging that you saw in both eyes you date within a day or two, is that correct? Yes. And that's a, within a day or two of your observation, is that correct, Doctor? Yes. <clears throat> and, and just so we're clear in, in sort of narrowing that down, is it even possible to date, like for example, that exact hour? That no. Hour? And again, these are just estimates. So, yes. yes. <clears throat> now, you mentioned um, a word that I want to make sure the jury understands. The retinal hemorrhaging that you saw in both eyes extended out to the periphery. P E R I P H E R E Y. Why? Why? Just a Y. Okay. Can you show us on the demonstrative aid how far that extends? Where is the periphery? The, the periphery is the area of the retina as it. Uh, tabs out here um, behind the iris or the colored uh, muscle part of the eye. So this would be the, the periphery um, behind the lens as the retina goes to an area called the aura serrata. In essence, the layers that are reflected in this demonstrative aid are, in essence, the, almost the entire eyeball. Yes. The back portion of the eye. <clears throat> Doctor, to a, reasonable med to a reasonable medical certainty and in your expert opinion based on your training and your experience and your evaluation of this child, did this child experience non-accidental head trauma and or shaking forces to herself? Yes. Now, the bleeding that we see at all levels, I just want to make sure, I think we've touched on it, just to make sure it's clear. Does, does the more the layers that we see the retinal hemorrhaging in, does that mean the force was more or just simply severe? You understand my question? It uh, is, <laughs> it's difficult to answer it in those terms. It's, uh, it requires severe, repeated uh, head trauma, what is termed abusive head trauma, not just an accident where you've hit, fallen and hit your head. So the medical terminology is non-accidental or abusive head trauma, which requires repeated uh, um, significant force of head injury. Thank you much. Now, Doctor, once you uh, 
uh, parted ways with the child during your con your console that morning, that afternoon, I guess. Um, the child was pronounced the next day. Did you ever see her again? No. All right. Did, did the eyeballs later get sent to the an eye institute here in Florida uh, for further examination to confirm your rectal hemorrhaging finding? Yes, I was made aware that the eye balls um, uh, post mortem were sent to Baskin Palmer Eye Institute at uh, University of Miami uh, for pathologic evaluation. And was that done in this case? <laughs> yes. And Dr. Buxbaum will be here tomorrow, I think, to speak a little bit about that. But did they confirm your findings of the retinal hemorrhage? Yes, the ocular pathology report did confirm uh, the retinal hemorrhaging identified at what's called the aura serrata, which is that peripheral retina, mid-periphery, equator, posterior pole, um, and some of the retinal hemorrhages contain white centers indicating the older hemorrhages. Um, and there are pre-retinal hemorrhages and optic nerve, nerve sheath hemorrhage uh, was identified. I'm going to erase uh, the demonstrative today. Where is the optic nerve sheet? Will you circle that for our jury? Um, it's the lining of, it's on the outer edge of the optic nerve, again, where the blood vessels are coming uh, through the optic nerve. Um, and so that optic <coughs> nerve sheath connects to the brain. And your description of what injury happened to the optic nerve sheath is what? that there, the associated head trauma with the subdural hemorrhage and um, uh, other findings um, with the retinal findings indicated that that uh, hemorrhage was also significant enough to cause the hemorrhage uh, around the optic nerve. Does that also give the, the indication that the trauma suffered by the child was severe? Yes. Lastly, doctor, I want to show you just two photographs and let me brief. Um, what do we see in states 145 and 146? We'll first start, if you want to look at your screen, what do we see in states 145? Uh, we are seeing the left eye and then we are seeing um, pre-retinal layered hemorrhages here um, and we see uh, intra-retinal here and then it's, uh, there's additional hemorrhages as you uh, extend further outward. This is the optic nerve, which uh, showed pallor or paleness at the time, um, as um, was noted uh, on her uh, CT report. Um, and again, just extensive hemorrhages here, and then there were scattered hemorrhages um, throughout the retina. Thank you. And again, this is the actual image of the eyeball of the left eye of Zykeria Robinson? Yes, with the rep cam Thank you. system. And then looking at states 146, um, whoops, are we looking at the now right eye of Zykeria Robinson? Yes, this is the right eye. And what do we see there? If you'd like to use your monitor, please do so. And here is the optic nerve. And you can see uh, hemorrhaging coming off of the optic nerve, um, and again, pre-retinal hemorrhaging um, indicated here, kind of the circular area. Um, here, this is the center of the vision called the macula, uh, which is the sharp fine detail of vision, and there's swelling of the retina in that area. Um, so there's not only bleeding, but there's swelling or edema of the retina. Does the word edema mean swelling? Yes. <clears throat> I'm only done. Yes. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. Okay. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> Doctor uh, Shushak. What you saw in the eyes of Zakiria, that wasn't from a punch to the face, was it? No. And a punch to the face would not cause that scattering at all levels, right? Uh, no, it requires significant uh, head injury, head trauma to induce those, that pattern of retinal hemorrhaging. And separate incidents that are separated in time, 
So separate strikes to the head or slaps to the face at separate incidents at separate times, maybe different days. They don't culminate eventually in that, correct? Uh, no, not a uh, slap or uh, separate incidents of multiple injuries of that sort. It would have to be um, significant uh, head trauma um, with that back and forth movement as we discussed, or sh it's called the shaken baby non-accidental trauma. And so I think what you're trying to tell this jury, doctor, is that what you saw in the eyes of Zakiri was not some, something from someone actually striking the child in the face, but a force on that child's head that had it go back and forth repeatedly with a lot of rotational force. Yes, and in conjunction with the subdural hemorrhage that was also reported, uh, the association between the two, the subdural hemorrhage is an indication for obtaining the consultation for abusive head trauma um, to look for retinal hemorrhages, which has a high association in uh, non-accidental trauma. Because both violently shaking a child and striking a child with a blunt with blunt force of the head, they can both cause a sub subdural hemorrhage, right? Yes, to different degrees. But what you saw was, in your expert opinion, more akin to a child being shaken. Yes, the findings um, and at the um, conclusion of the consultation note, um, there are studies which are systemic reviews that um, discuss the um, probability of abuse is 90 to 94 percent with the retinal hemorrhage uh, in abusive head trauma with the distribution that was noted in association with findings of subdural hemorrhage. And in your world, when you keep seeing abusive head trauma, you're talking about that violent force back and forth on the head. Yes, not, not an accident or a single blow like falling from a couch or falling and just striking your head. Or someone striking the head with a, with a, with a fist. Or, right, a single incident, yes. And um, finally, um, based on your review of this child and examination, you cannot tell this jury exactly when this injury occurred that caused those red hemorrhages? There was evidence of older and newer hemorrhaging, so which indicated uh, repeated abusive head trauma. And you cannot say who caused that repeated head trauma, can you, doctor? I cannot. Thank you very much. Anything else? No, Your Honor, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. The state would call Chris Lombardozzi. You solemnly swear or affirm the testimony of this exhibit shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you go. I do. Since I 
believe September 7th of, that's maybe been two years and six months, I believe, I don't remember the exact date. Prior to that employment, did you work for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? Yes, ma'am, I did. How long did you work for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? Uh, from November 4th, 2002 until November 8th, 2020. While working for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, were you assigned to the Criminal Forensics Unit? I was assigned to the Computer Forensics Unit, yes. I apologize, Computer Forensics Unit. And how long were you in that unit? Uh, from September 22nd, 2014 until my retirement date. Okay. Can you explain to the jury what your job was as a detective in that unit? Yes, so as a computer forensic examiner, um, my role was to examine data sets uh, acquired from typically physical devices, things like cameras, uh, cell phones, computers, potentially you know, uh, external media like SD cards and things of that nature. And what sort of training did you go through in order to perform your job as a detective in the computer forensics unit? I attended a number of different training programs uh, at high level. I am a multi-program graduate of the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center's Cyber Division, uh, as well as the National Computer Forensics Institute. I had a number of different training courses for cell phone forensic investigations, computer forensic investigations, uh, specific to certifications for cell phones. Uh, I was certified as a Celebrite certified operator and analyst through uh, the Celebrite company. What are the different ways that you can extract data from a cellular telephone? Uh, sometimes when data can't be extracted, there's a way to, to take pictures of the screen of the phone. Um, there is a technology called chip off, where um, if data is not able to be acquired directly through the device itself, uh, there's a way to melt off the microchip and extract that data that way. Um, there are also other tools like the Cellbrite uh, UFED tool, where you can plug an external device up to the phone um, and extract data that way. During these different types of extractions, are you changing the data, like the text messages, usernames, things of that nature inside the phone? The forensic examiners are not changing the data. Okay. When you receive a device, are you informed of the facts of the case? Uh, to some degree, yes. Okay. Um, when a phone is downloaded, are you tasked with going through to determine um, if there are items of evidentiary value? Uh, typically, yes. Sometimes the detectives will ask for specific, link, uh, specific things, whether it's a, a particular type of artifact, or sometimes they'll just say, you know, provide us everything that you have. In this case, were you provided a Samsung Galaxy J3 device to download? Yes, ma'am, I was. And did you receive that device on October 30th of 2018? I uh, would have to check the thing, but that does sound familiar, really yes. Okay. Um, did you also receive a search warrant in order to download that device? Uh, I would have to look at the search warrant, but yes, I know there were search warrants associated with that investigation. Do you document the condition of the phone when you receive it? Uh, we do in the way of photographs, yes. Okay. Um, once the warrant was received and you documented the condition of the phone, did you attempt to conduct an extraction of the phone? Uh, I have, to, I have to say I don't remember doing the, this particular piece of the investigation. It's been some time, um, but I did generate a report based on my work for that. Okay. Um, so it was data extracted from the phone? Yes, ma'am. And once the extraction was completed, you mentioned there is a report that is done. Correct. Prior to your testimony here today, have you had the opportunity to review the extraction report in its entirety? Yes, I did. Have you also had the opportunity to review uh, PDFs that were generated from that extraction? Yes, I did. And were you able to determine if those PDFs actually came from the full extraction? Thank you. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. Mr. Lombard, as the first, I am showing you what has been marked for identification purposes as C8K. Do you recognize that item? Yes, ma'am, I do. All right, what is that? Uh, this is the Samsung cell phone, SMJ 327 t one And have you had the opportunity to review the specifically the IMEI number on that phone to say that it was uh, the phone that was downloaded? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. 
Anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I was just going to say I, I compared the high EI number to that of the extracted uh, data set from the report provided. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, the state moves state 8K into evidence as the next number to exhibit. Any legal objection? No legal objection to 8K. Other than the previously filed motion? Other than the what, what number is that, Madam Clerk? 184. 184, thank you. Mr. Lombard, next, I am showing you states L, 8L, 8M, and 8A. Do you recognize these items? Yes, ma'am, these are uh, reports, uh, extraction reports from the Celebrite uh, generated All right. And uh, Mr. Lombardo, do these three reports, 8L, 8M, and 8N, represent portions of data pulled from the extraction from that cellular device? Yes, ma'am. All right, Your Honor, at this time, the state would enter states 8L, 8M, and 8N as the next one of Any legal objection other than those previously noted? Yes, Your Honor, and I request a sidebar to discuss it with the outside okay. of the jury. Your Honor, I'm, I was moving those into evidence. Have they been accepted okay. into uh, evidence? The objections are ruled. Um, Madam Clerk. Okay. And that's going to be numbers what? Uh, 185, 186, and 187. different versions and those versions change in time with different updates and features that are added. 
Uh, in this particular case, the version is uh, 7.8.0.94. Uh, the report creation date listed below outlines the aforementioned uh, date and time. Uh, the time zone settings are set to UTC. Uh, UTC is universal coordinated time. Uh, think of it as a uh, standard time uh, with different hours, much like Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, in this case, Eastern Standard Time is UTC minus five. So that means that uh, based on the UTC time, the time of the uh, of the report and the data sets um, are of Eastern Standard Time. Um, the location, um, we used uh, 501 East Bay Street as our address, however, that was not the specific address for the forensic lab, but the broader Jacksonville Sheriff's Office headquarters. Um, there's a case number, the type of case listed as homicide, it's listed as uh, evidence number one for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office Computer Forensic Investigations Unit. Okay, and then the source extraction just, just tells us the type of phone that the data was extracted from? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And we can see that that's that Samsung Galaxy J3. Correct. Okay. Um, scrolling down to page uh, two of the same exhibit, states 185. Um, the contents here, are these messages that we're looking at? Uh, yes, they are. Okay. Can you just walk the jury through what each column represents, starting with folder, going to party time, and so on? Uh, sure, so folder uh, is listed as the inbox, uh, much like your uh, inbox, outbox, spam, junk, things of that nature. Um, the party is the from, uh, and there's a, a timestamp there. Um, the network, uh, as far as the timestamps, the network timestamp is listed there. Um, the status of the message will be uh, read, unread, um, and then the message is the contents of the message itself. Um, to the right of that, you see deleted, um, and you obviously it would be either yes or no. Uh, for this particular line, that would indicate that a message was deleted. Okay, so that means that even if a user of a phone deletes data, there are times when you all can recover it? There are. In certain situations, yes. All right. And this is still part of State's Exhibit 185. Um, what does this uh, portion of the extraction report, report reflect? Uh, these are user accounts um, that were recovered from the device. Okay, and uh, Mr. Lombardozzi, the username in um, row one is what? Uh, Jonte Harris, sr at gmail.com. Okay. I have no further questions for this witness at this time. Okay, Ross. <clears throat> Sir, I just want to clear something up that may not have been clear to our jury uh, during your direct. You actually were unable to perform the actual extraction of that phone, right? Uh, I believe that was the case. Again, I don't remember, but um, per the report that was submitted, there were specialized tools that were used to recover that data. Would seeing a copy of a Secret Service memo for Detective Hector Quintana dated November 27th of 2018 help you remember? Uh, Detective uh, Quintana is an employee of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Uh, just for the record, but yes, potentially, I don't know if it would help me. May I approach the witness, Sean? You may. Sir, if you could just review this document to yourself and then you're done with it. Sure.
So does that refresh your recollection as to whether or not you were able to perform the forensic extraction of this dump? Um, not particularly. It's, it's not uncommon that when our tools are not uh, suited to defeat certain devices, uh, those devices are oftentimes provided to the Secret Service or other law enforcement agencies where uh, they have tools that can extract that for our subsequent uh, analysis. So I think what you're saying is you could not extract it yourself. You know, the tool was not able to that I was provided by the agency. All right, and so therefore, you sent that Samsung phone to the Secret Service. Uh, I did not. Based on the chain of custody there, uh, I may have to reread it, but I believe I submitted that to Hector Quintana, and Quintana provided that over to them. All right, and you can't tell this jury where exactly that phone was and who had it, why the Secret Service had it, right? The data come back, comes back to us, and I can't speak to where data went you know, after it leaves our office. And you weren't even the person that coordinated with the Secret Service? Uh, no. Uh, we had a, a delegated person at the time, if you will, a liaison. Uh, usually those requests would go from the supervisor to someone else. And that's, that's how that would go. Now also, uh, sir, when you do a mobile device extraction examination, you also create a summary sheet, is that right? That is correct. And did you have an opportunity to review the summary sheet for the Samsung Galaxy J3 Prime, IMEI NE8065? Did you have an opportunity to review that? I did. And isn't it true, sir, that the owner of that device listed on your own summary is Michelle Canmore? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for hearsay. Brody, you may Yes, Judge. I, in that manner, we ask that question? Yes, sir. Um, 
Mr. Lombardozzi isn't it true you issued a examination summary report that indicated the owner of the Samsung Galaxy phone that was just submitted to evidence was Michelle Campbell? I would have to review the document to clarify that. May I approach your honor? You may. <clears throat> Sir, if you could just review the document and again look up when you're done reviewing it. Yes, sir, that is what is listed there. And the reason that Michelle Canmore is listed as the owner of the Samsung Galaxy J3 Prime on your report is that that is the information that you were given by someone or gleaned from some report. Is that correct? I didn't look at that aspect of the report, sir. Now, in this case, you actually got a total of five phones given to you, correct? I would have to look at all of them or the reports individually. I don't remember how many I received. You got a number of phones. Okay. I don't remember how many I got. Sorry. If I may approach your honor. You may. Sir, again, if you could just review the document and look at the video. Yes, sir. Thank you. So there's three summaries here. And that, that's fine, sir. Oh, okay. So, sir, you were given at least four phones to analyze, is that right? Uh, that's my understanding based on this discussion. I've seen, I believe it was evidence item one, three, and six. I uh, may have the numbers out of order, maybe they're not correct, but I did see the three summaries there, yes, sir. And you have no recollection of what, if anything, was on those phones? I don't have personal memory of, of that, no. Do you know if any of those phones simply did turn off? Uh, based on the summaries that I have reviewed, I believe there was at least one uh, that would not power on. And isn't it true in that case the lead detective, Detective Russell, told you not to worry about it? Objection, Your Honor. Here's yes, say. One moment, Your Honor. Yes, sir. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Anything else? Go ahead. No, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Okay, uh, we're ready? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. All right, let's bring your hand. The state would call Michelle Cannamore.
record. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you die? Ms. Canmore, how old are you? 31. Are you from Jacksonville? I was born and was held in Arkansas, but I was raised in Jacksonville, Florida. Since you were three? Yes, ma'am. What side of town did you grow up on? At the west side and the south side. Ms. Canmore, as you sit before this jury, you're currently in custody, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you were charged with crimes in connection to this case? Yes, ma'am. Have you admitted your guilt and pled? I did. What did you plead to? Aggravated manslaughter. Of a child? Of a child. And is that a first degree felony? Yes, ma'am. And you understand that that's punishable by up to 30 years in the Florida State Prison? Yes, ma'am. And you also understand that as a part of your plea agreement, the state, despite your cooperation, will recommend 25 years in the Florida State Prison? Yes, ma'am. That's just five years shy of the max? Yes, ma'am. May I approach a witness? Yeah. Ms. Canmore, I'm showing you State Exhibit 8Z. Do you recognize this document? Yes, ma'am. What do you recognize this document to be? My signature. And do you have your initials here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you signed it on this back page? Yes, ma'am. And does this represent the agreement that you made with the State of Florida? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time, the state would enter into evidence state state Z as the next number of exhibit. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. What number is that, Michael? Uh, 188. And may I re approach, Your Honor? You may. Now I'm showing you state exhibit 188. Ms. Cameron, on what date did you enter this plea? On November 2nd, 2019. Is that November 26th? November 26, 2019. Okay, thank you. Just over a year after your arrest? Yes, ma'am. In 2018, were you living at the Oak Tree Apartments? Yes, ma'am. When did you move in there? April 2018. All right, and when you moved into that apartment, um, who did you move in with? Me and Naya and Zakiria. All right. Can you describe for the members of the jury the layout of that apartment? When you walk to the front door on the right side is the living room. When you look straight ahead, that's the dining room. On the other right side is the kitchen. And when you go towards the hallway, there is a closet, the bathroom, and on that side is Akira's room, Anaya's room, and straight ahead is my room. Okay. Um, Ms. Canamore, do you see something on your screen right now? No. Can you see the seal, the seal of the state of Florida there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm showing you seats exhibit one. What's the jury looking at in this photograph? The front of my apartment. Seats two? The door, front door of my apartment. And states four. On the right side is the couch. Straight ahead is the dining room and the kitchen. Okay. States five. The living room and the kitchen. State six. The living room. State seven. The kitchen. State eight. The kitchen. State nine. The stove and the microwave and the kitchen. State 14, what would be on the right hand side of that hallway? On the right hand side would be a closet in the girls' bathroom. 
And on the left hand side, what's on that side of the hallway? The dedicated care room and a nice bedroom. Is this the bathroom in States 15? Yes, ma'am. States 19, whose room are we looking into? Is that curious? States 20? Is that curious? Is there anything in that room? No. States 21? Is that curious room? States 22? That guy is room. States 23? That's a guy that curious bed. So at some times, did they sleep in that room, both of them? Sometimes. States 25, whose room is this? Mine. States 26. My bed. And states 32. My bathroom. Now, Ms. Cannamore, when you and your girls moved into that apartment, did your sister also move in? She did. When was that? May of 2018. What room did she stay in when she first moved in? That curious. Was your sister responsible for anything while she was living in your home? Taking care of my girls. Okay. Were you working at the time? Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about your girls. How many children did you have? Two. When did you have your children? I had a night in my 24th, 2012, and I had a curious until my 9th, 2013. Would you call Anaya Naya for short? Yes, ma'am. And would you call Zykeria Kiri for short? Yes, ma'am. Did Zykeria have any sort of health issues when she was born? No, not that I know of. All I know is that she was lactose intolerant and she's allergic to bananas. Okay. When she was a baby, did they say she was anemic? Yes, they did. Is that something, something she grew out of? Yes, ma'am. And did they also say she had a misshapen head? She did. Did she have any issues with learning? She was more than the rest of the kids. Okay. Um, did you work with her at home before you put her in school? I did not. Okay. Did you work with Anaya before you put her in school? I did. Okay. For the most part, was Ikeria an overall normal kid? She was. At the time that they were born, were you dating their father, Zafir Robinson? I was. Did the two of you eventually part ways? Six years later, yes. But did you guys continue to maintain some sort of agreement with the children? We did. In 2018, did you start dating someone else? I did. Who was that? Jonathan Harris. Ms. Canamore, take your time on this, but can you please look around the courtroom and tell me if you see Jonathan Harris here today? Yes. Can you tell me what side of the courtroom he's seated on and an article of clothing that he's wearing? He's on the left side with a white shirt on. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witness has positively identified Jonte Harris. The record shall so reflect. When did the first, when did the two of you first meet? In high school. Would you hang out in high school? No. Did you guys run in the same circles in high school? No. Did the two of you reconnect later in life? We did. When was that? January of 2018. Where did the two of you see each other again? Jonte came into my job. What job were you working at? 7-Eleven off of Lane. Did, did the two of you exchange contact information? He gave me his Instagram. From there, did the two of you begin an intimate relationship? We did. At first, were things serious between the two of you? No. Did they later become serious? Yes, ma'am. When was that? February. February? Um, did you introduce him to your children? I did. Prior to that, did he know that you had kids? No. Did he eventually move in with you? Yes, ma'am. When? June 2018. And why did he move in with you? He and his sister wasn't in the home. So you needed a place to live? Yes, ma'am. And June of 2018, you were at the Oak Tree apartment? Yes, I was. When he first moved in, who was living in apartment 204? Me, Zakaria, and I, and my sister. Okay. Um, did your children eventually go to visit with their father? Yes, ma'am. When was that? Late June, early July. Okay. So there was a period of time where it was just you, Jonte, and your sister. Yes, ma'am. How was the relationship between you and Jonte in the beginning? It was good at first. It was good at first? Did your sister move out of the apartment? Yes, ma'am. When was that? Early July. 
Okay. Now you mentioned it a couple of times that you were working at 7-Eleven. When did you start working at 7-Eleven? January 2018. And you mentioned Lane and Lennox? Yes, ma'am. Did you work at any other locations? Lane and Lucy. What was your typical shift? The night shift. What would those hours be? 10 to 7, 10 to 6, 11 to 6, or like 12 to 6. So overnight shifts? Yes, ma'am. When you mentioned um, that your sister was watching the kids, that she was helping take care of it, of take care of them. Is that because you were working those overnight shifts? Yes, ma'am. Did Jante share in any of the financial responsibilities in the house? No, not really. Okay. Was he in school? Yes, he was. And were you actually helping pay for his school? Yes, I was. About a, about a month after Jante moved in, um, your sister moved out. She did. Okay. Did the girls come back to live with you? Yes, they did. When? Late. <clears throat> Early August. Okay. And why did they come back to live with you? They had to go to school. Were they going to live with you full time or were they still going between you and their dad? They were living with me full time. Where was Naya going to school? At Highbrook Elementary. What about Kiri? She was going to a daycare. I'm not sure I remember the name, but it starts with Alpha. Alpha Omega sounds right? Yes, ma'am. Did they start school in August? They did. And at, this, at that time, you were still working that overnight shift? I was. So at night, who would be with the children? Jose. What time would you leave for work? <sighs> oh, yeah, I was at me for the five. PM? Yes, ma'am. How did you get to work? JTA. Say it one more time. JTA. The bus? Yes, ma'am. Did you have a car at the time? No. How long was the bus ride that you would take to work? It would come like at 9. And by the time I make it to work, it would be 9.45. All right. Now, before you would leave to, leave to go to work, did all of you eat dinner together? We did. What about getting the girls ready for bed? It was my job. That was your job? <laughs> Once you left for work, would the girls be asleep? No. Okay, so they would have time with Jante? They will. I'm going to take you back to state uh, 23. We see two beds in this room, right? Yes, we do. Um, who would sleep in this room? A night is like area. Right. Were there times that Zacharia slept in another room? She slept in the living room. Okay. In state 21, you mentioned that this was Zacharia's room. Why do you call this Zacharia's room? Because it was her room when I first moved in. Okay. Was this room taken away from her at some point? Yes, ma'am. Why was it taken away from her? Because my sister moved in. So I let her use Zacharia's room at the time. Okay. Who was responsible for the discipline in the house? In the beginning, I used to discipline my girls. Okay. Can you explain to the jury what your form of discipline was? They would just get popped. What does pop mean to you? Like on the hand or on the butt. What on the hand? Can you demonstrate for us? Like right here. Okay, like a smack on the hand is what you're demonstrating? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you also mentioned on the foot? Yes, ma'am. Okay, like a spank on the butt? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, would you also refer to that as a whooping? Yes, I will. Okay. Um, is whooping just a, the term that you use versus spanking? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you ever use a belt on the girls? I did. You did? Yes. Okay. Um, why would you use a belt on them? Just the discipline belt. Where would you use the belt? On their butt. Would you use all of your strength when you hit them with the belt? No. Enough to get their attention? Yes, ma'am. Objection leading. Yes, Ron. Um, when you would use a belt on the girls, how would you how would you use it? I would roll it up to like a small end. 
Okay, so that's a little bigger, right? Um, have you ever punched either of the girls? No, ma'am. Have you ever struck either of the girls in the face? No, ma'am. Have you ever bitten either of the girls? No, ma'am. Was there a point where you turned over the discipline to Jante? I did. Was this with your agreement? Yes, ma'am. Why would you let a man that's not the father of the girls discipline them? Because I was building a family with Jante. Okay. Um, did you expect him to discipline in a certain way? The same way as I would. Did he discipline in the same way you did? No. When is the first time that you noticed that his form of discipline was different from yours? When he picks that carry up and choked her and threw him her. He was doing these types of things in front of you? Yes, ma'am. Had you ever seen him bite her? He did. Can you tell, tell the members of the jury about that? He fell on my arm and leave. Why did he bite her on her arm and leg? He was inflicting pain on her. He was inflicting pain on her. He was inflicting pain on her? <laughs> Go ahead. He would. Did you say anything to him when he bit her? I told him to stop. And what did he say back? Shut up. Was that a common response? Yes, ma'am. When did you pull Zykeria out of school? Late August, early September. Why did you pull her out of school? Because her, she had bruises on her. She had bruises on her? Yes, ma'am. From who? Dad. What were you, why did you pull her out? <laughs> because whenever Jante would hear her, he would be punching her in the face and her stomach. Were you afraid someone might see? Yes, ma'am. Did you call the police? No. Hold on one thing. Uh, don't leave the witness, but we asked the question. What, did you call the police? No, I did not. Did you tell their father? No. Did you tell your sister? No, ma'am. Did you tell anyone? No, I didn't. Why not? Because I was scared. Scared of what? I was scared of coming to jail, and I was scared of losing my girls. Did you intend to keep her out of school forever? No. Did she go back to school? But she did. I'm sorry, say it one more time. Yes. She did? Okay, for how long? No. Okay. Why did she get taken out of school again? Because she had more bruises for her. She had more bruises on her? When you pulled her out the second time, when was that? Early October. Okay. Did Jonte have any say in pulling her out of school? Yes. What did he say? She wasn't learning nothing in school. Okay. Did Anaya stay in school? She did. So now that Kiri was out of school, were you home with her during the day? During the day, yes, I was. And were there times where both you and Jante were home with her? Yes, ma'am. Now, you mentioned that Jante was in school. Did he go to school every single day? No, he did not. In September of 2018, did you get a new phone? I did. Uh, did Jante also get a new phone? He did. Who purchased those phones? I did. Who was paying for those phones? I was. Did the two of you text frequently? We did. Was it normal or routine for the two of you to text each other when um, you would be going somewhere? Yes, ma'am. Like if you got to the bus stop, would you send him a text? I will. What about when you get to work? Yes, ma'am. When you're on your way home? Yes, ma'am. Was the same true for him? Yes, ma'am.
Ms. Cannamore, I'm showing you um, State's Exhibit 185. Have you had the opportunity to look at these text messages? Yes, ma'am, I have. All right, and we see um, a name, Shep. Who is Shep? Me. Is that what Jante would call you? Yes. And these messages, are these messages between you and Jante? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm going to direct your attention to line 440. Who is sending that message? Right here. Okay. It says from Shep, right? Yeah. Okay, so is that coming from you? Yes, it is. Okay, and what does the message say? Hey, baby, I made it. Okay, so is this an example of how you would tell him where, where, when you made it somewhere? Yes, ma'am. Um, line 425 here, who is this message from? Me. And can you just read the content of this message on uh, September 21st? I need me here. I'm at work. I'll stay positive and be safe. I love you so much. My ears. Okay. So again, you're letting him know where you're at. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Canamore, were there times where you would actually witness what John Tate was doing to Kiri? Yes, ma'am. And were there times where the two of you would communicate about it afterwards via text? Yes, ma'am. Would he also voice his complaints about her via text? Yes, he would. Ms. Cannamore, I'm uh, looking at line 439 here. This message is, it says, to Shell. So is that coming to you? Yes, ma'am. And what does that message say? Now you finish eating. All right, and the time on this is 11.05, so would you have been at work at that time? Yes, ma'am. All right, so, sorry. Um, these message, messages uh, go up, so line 438, this message from Jante to you, what does it say? The others are sleeping around, hoping the words come in. Ms. Cannamore, take your time. The other is just standing around, moving in one spot. Who is he talking about, the other? It's a carrier. All right. What does he then say in line 437? In a room. What room would he be referring to? The carrier's room. Is that the room that didn't have anything in it? Yes, ma'am. Line 434, from Jante to you, what does it say? But I'm patrolling Naya. What does that mean, patrolling Naya? I think he was right there. Okay. And line 432 from Jante to you, what does this message say here? If she don't say nothing all day, we don't, we would lie either. Okay. Um, was Zakiria not talking at some point? She stopped talking when she got abused. She stopped talking when she got abused. So prior to the abuse, did she talk normally? Yes, she did. Okay. Ms. Cannon, are you ready to proceed? Okay. Looking at line 424 on 921, this message from Dante to you, what does this say here? She is terrible. Right here. Line 424. As soon as you left, she threw up all over the house, shaking my head. SMH means shaking my head? Yes, ma'am. What do you say back to him in line 422? Shaking my head, that don't make no damn sense. I don't know what I'm going to do about my old kids. I don't understand what the hell they do. 
what are the images? Can you get it together? And then what do you say in line 421? If you don't kill the girl, don't lose it, calm down. And just make it her take a bath this year to get it. Miss Canmore, why are you telling him don't kill the girl? Because he was really mad. Everything she did, he got mad. Okay. Have you made any threats before? This man. <laughs> what kind of threats did he make before? I don't think he was going to kill my daughter. In line 420, still on September 21st, this message from you. What does this message here say? I truly apologize for her behavior. I don't know what's gotten into period. Why she want to act up and not listen? In line 419, another message from you. What does that say? Do you need me to come home? Line 418, his reply. No. Why are you apologizing to him for her behavior? Because I felt like I wasn't doing nothing right. You felt like you were doing nothing right? Is that a yes? Yes, it's an objection. Uh, either counsel's hard. She's repeating the testimony. Well, she is, um, but I'm keeping track. It's, she's doing it uh, uh, accurately, and, and I think it's helping. Uh, uh, we're, I think we're all having a little trouble here in the room. I understand the objection, I get it. And, and I would just object to right. counsel testifying. Ms. Cantor, no. Try to limit it if you can. Yes, Your Honor, I was trying to help that court reporter out. Ms. Cannamore, I'll direct your attention to text messages on September 23rd of 2018. Message 409 from Jante to you. What does this message say? He yeah, put ice on her. Who is he referring to? Zakiri. And then you reply in line 408. What is your reply? Her face is swollen. Why was her face swollen? <laughs> because I don't think I punch her in the face. Did you ever punch her in her face? No, ma'am. Line 406, still on September 23rd of 2018, from you, what does this message say? Baby, you gotta find another method. Could they hit, please? What are you talking about? Another method for what? I want him to stop hitting that kid. <laughs> and his reply in line 405? I'm done. Your reply in line 404? Hey, don't promise me if you're still going to do it. Line 403? He said a lot. His reply in 402? Trust me. 401. I can't do nothing about them being crazy. And your reply in line 400. I do trust you, baby. And no, we can't, but I will figure something out because I can't see the man I deeply love walk away from me. His reply in 399. Okay. His reply in 398. Or I'll be in jail. Your reply in 397. Don't say that, baby. Just leave her alone. I gotta step up. You step down from her. Isolate yourself. Isolate yourself when you feel like you're about to go off. Miss Cannonmore, did he stop hitting Zykeria after that string of messages? <laughs> no, he didn't. Going to <laughs> Line 393 on 923. This message from John Tay. What does it say? Waiting for you to heal, so waiting for you to kill Kiri. Heal Kiri? Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And 392. I have a mother daughter. I don't know what he did. Okay. His uh, reply to that in 391. I need to be away. What is heal Kiri? What does that mean? Clean up her abuses. Can you say it one more time? Clean up her abuses. Okay. Um, were you using something to clean up her her injuries? Yes, ma'am. What? A first aid kit that I got 
Going to line 369, still on September 24th, this message from Jante to you says what? She does not get snacks or drinks unless it's water. Why is he saying that? Because her carry wasn't talking to us. So? Jante felt like she didn't deserve anything. Okay, so was this punishment? Yes. Again, the next the leading sense. <clears throat> Going to line 362, a message from Jante on September 24th. What does this message say? Make her speed walk. Are you speed walking? Why is he talking about speed walking? He wanted us to exercise. Who is we? Me and the girls. Going to line 360, a message from John Day to you on September 24th. What does he say? She moved too slow. You have to push her too well. Real. For real. She's a nervous baby. And line 359? And that still makes her in, tr in trouble because she will be trouble to us. And I have a reputation within myself that makes does better about turning like this. And your reply in 358? We are speed walking and I understand. I know your rules. Line 357, your, I'm sorry, his reply to you. Our. And 356, your reply. Our rules. And finna get on the bus soon to go to Jamie's. Miss Canmore, who. Who dictated the rules in the house? Jante. Did you follow his rules? Yes. Why? Because Jante wanted control in the house. Okay. Going to line 354, we're still on September 24th of 2018. This message is from you. Can you read this message, please? We're going to walk all the way home because when they got an attitude because I took away the popcorn the store clerk brought her and she thought she was going to get us back. I'm going to be her ass. Who is little baby? It's like here. All right, you saying that message, I'm going to beat her red ass. Why are you saying that? Because she was acting out. Okay. What do you mean by that? I was going to whoop her. What is what we? I was going to use a bill to discipline her. Okay. You say red ass. Why do you say red ass? Because she's the same complexion as me. Okay, so that is a term for complexion? Okay. In line 352, this message from you to Jante, what does it say? That doesn't mean come home and jump on that damn girl. I got it. And 351, his reply to you? She started eating them. Your reply in 350? No, I took them. She didn't eat them. Okay. His reply in 349? What did she walk a slower way? 
Again, his method in 348. 48. Line 347, this message from you. She called at the two weeks, started walking fast, they hit me. Almost got hit by a car. I had to anchor up too many times. Couldn't get to this house and be on it. It's been across the street. Ms. Canmore, did you yank her up? I did. Okay. Can you describe for the jury how you yanked her? By her shirt. By her shirt? Okay. Did she complain of any injury after that? No. Did you see that she was injured in some way? No. Did you beat her when you got home? No, I didn't. Did you do anything to her? No. Why not? You told him you were. So I wanted to jump into what we could have did. Going to line 345, this message again on 924 from Dante to you. What does it say? What did you tell her to walk faster? And then 344 again from Dante. Or did she do it on her own? Line 344 again from Dante. Be real. I'm sorry. Be real. Line 342. Because I told you not to talk to her. Line 341. She gives us the side of treatment and she gets nothing. They doing that because she is cute. She has a backward spirit in her. Line 340 again from Jante. And the devil don't be around us or nobody. What is a backward spirit? What is he referring to? He thought my baby was corrupt. In line 340, he uses the word devil. Who's he referring to? Zakaria. Going to line 338, still on 924, this message from Jante, what does it say? We have to spoil it out here because she's going to learn it, and now you're going to learn it too. Line 337. By her not talking, she is one of the greatest listeners. Line 336. I hate her abs across her head. Line 335. So she not. So she know not to play with me. Line 334. She gonna learn. Line 333. Her punishments are free for the ever for real. Line 332. She will not be a devil. And she is a state of mind. Like she don't have to listen because she's irritating. And again, Ms. Canmore, who is he referring to? Zakaria. Finally, your reply to that stream of messages in 331 is what? I know you told me not to talk to her. She did it on her own because she thought I was going to hear her. And okay about the spoiling her. And his reply in 330? No, you need to listen. His reply in 329? Yeah, but running off is stupid. His reply in 328. You can't run from problems you created. His reply in 327. You should not, will not. And 325. Besides, she is working my trouble some ways for real. And your reply in 324. I'm not running away from my problems. I'm understanding now and I'm not listening to you. And your reply again in 323. And I know that's why I keep telling you to walk away. Because I don't need you to have more eyes at you. Keep the door unlocked. And the next message from him in line 308. I'm leaving. The next message from him in 307. You is Aggie. What's Aggie? Aggravating. All right. And your reply in 306. I ain't do nothing to you but make you stop hurting my daughter because you were taking it too far. She's already busy enough and you put a hole in the shower. Ms. Canamore, what did you see that made you send that text message? I 
like took the girls to the shower one day and Zakira wasn't standing still. So Jante got mad and picked her up by her neck and threw it to the shower wall.
It says 275, but you're showing 279. 279, Your Honor, is what I was referring to. I need the bathroom. My damn self. I will, don't touch her, please. You will what? What are you telling me you will do? I was gonna whoop her. Did you? No. In line 277, I'm sorry, 278, his reply to you? I will. And your reply in 277? You will win. And then in 275, you say what? No, tell me. And in 274, he says what? Whoop her. All right, um, taking your attention now to uh, October 1st of 2018, in line 265, a message from Jante to you. What does that message say? They need to be asleep when I get home. And in 264? <laughs> and before you go to bed, make sure she sleep. Who is he talking to? Talking about? Zachary. And in 263? Because she's looking fucked up. And who's that a reference to? Zachary. Line 262, your reply? Okay, they will. Now you fall asleep while I'm doing her hair. Now I'm literally in the room. His message in 260? 260. Yeah, I'm saying curious. And 259? Her face. And your reply in 257? I know who you was talking about when you said she looked fucked up. Your reply in 256? You gotta stop hitting her ASAP. She looks bad and I don't need you. The hot bars and the took it away from me. You have to find something else to hit when you get mad. Please, I'm begging you. And I gave her, she is cold in here. And in 255, this reply to you. Stop telling people shit. I'm done with the BS. In 253, this reply. She will be good around the weekend. 252, his reply. Cold showers and ice and warm sleep. <laughs> You're replying 251. I'm not talking to anyone. That's what you don't see. Going now to October 4th of 2018, line 241, the message from Jante to you. I don't have to deal with you guys, and I'm not. I'm sorry, 241, Ms. Gilmore, this message here. I made a crucial mistake having my mother close to you, for real. I'm not cool with her, and you think that it's because of who I am, and so be it. Did you have a relationship with his mom? I did. Did the two of you talk? We did. In 240, what does he also say? I don't have to deal with you guys, and I'm not. And in 239, what does he say? I have to be around someone who learns and wants to learn for words. In 2.36, still on the same date, um, what is your reply to him? All I've been doing is being here for you, learning and listening to everything you said to me. But anything I do is not good enough for you. 
I'm fighting to keep us, fighting for our family. Shit, I don't even have my own family on my side. I know you don't see eye to eye with your mom. I get that. She calls my phone worried about her son. And if you want me to back off of your mom, I will. It's for you to say I'm not for you. It's fucked up. That's all I have been for you, the kids, and anything else you need me for. Still on that same date, in line 228, his reply to you. Which one? 228, Ms. Canmore, this line right here. So I want someone, somebody I know, and when they change, they will give me a chance to move in intelligence with them. But you never, ever going to be able to, able or capable to be with me. Going now to October 11th of 2018, in line 203, this message from Dante to you. Hit it downtown, baby. And in line 202. What is she doing making a mess? Who is she? Zakaria. Your reply. Okay. What you do, run to the bus stop. And know what she done and she's sitting on the couch across from me. Did you want her in the living room or and damn you moving fast as hell well? Why are you asking him if he wants her in the living room? Because that was his area. Line 200 his reply. Have her clean up. Line 199 his reply. You don't do nothing. Line 198 his reply. She earns much TV. And 197 is your reply. Okay. And okay, earn. you mean by making her do chores. She can't watch TV. Love you too, love, love. And his reply to that in 196. Yeah. And in 194, his message. What y'all watching? No, ma'am. 194. Yeah, put... Put that warm rag on her. Who's he referring to? Zakaria. Why do you need to put a warm rag on her? He was talking about her arm. What about her arm? It was sticking out. What do you mean by that? It's like her phone was broke. In line 192, what do you say? I did need the warm rag. I'm gonna warm it back up. Wait, cold. They're looking at learning stuff now. And talking. It's okay. Going now to October 12th of 2018. <clears throat> His message to you in line 188. Here's 188, Ms. Canmore. The only thing she was eating is vegetables. And again, his message in 187. She is eating nothing else for me. His message in 186. She's not special to me because she has a way of being mad and thinks it's so What's going on? His message in 185. She is not a person again for not running because she needs sleep always. Who is she that he's referring to? Zakaria. Was she allowed to eat specific foods? Only veggies. Why? That's the diet you put her on. He who? Trust me. In line 184, his message is to you. What is she here for real? She's still in her room, nothing to do. Miss Cameron, what room is that? Hers. Not the ones with the beds? No. Uh, 
Uh, line 182. His message to you. Remember how to use the bathroom? Or until we get her medical treatment. And that's line 181. Yes, sir. Did you seek medical treatment for her? No. Did he ever seek medical treatment for her? No, ma'am. Did he ever ask you to seek medical treatment for her? He did. He did? Why didn't you? Because I was scared. Of what? I'm going to It was my girls. Okay. In line 180, this message to you from Dante, what does it say? So far away, she has to be down and her doing nothing. Line 179. Eating vegetables and drinking water. Line 178. No solid foods for her. They're not good anyways. That's line 177. What about 176? And more shit to have shit in. Line 175. She can't wear tight clothes. And her ear was brown because she had blood in her pelts. Line 174. From the women. Line 173. She needs cold medicine too. Miss Cannamore, whose whooping caused her to have brown in her urine? Just. Your reply in 172. Well, that's a lot you said, but I hear you, and I'm understand you, and I'll bring you that much. I'll see you. I have so much to job. Did you ever bring home medicine for her? I did. What kind of medicine? It was like sleeping medicine. In line 171, <clears throat> what is his reply to you? Who grabbed my something? She get rid of sick and makes her go straight to bed. In line 170, his reply to you? Yeah, of course. She have is because her blood don't get everywhere in her body. Line 169. She has a head too. Line 168. <laughs> The only way to cure it is to rest, drink plenty of fluids, medicine, to sleep, and eating a diet. Line 167. So a good diet is veggies. And water is salad, maybe. And that's 166. What about 165? Her and I cannot eat the same things. Can you explain that to the jury? Whatever we ate, now you can eat. But that carry was on the street that they did. Your reply in 139? Yeah, 
hope she do for the both of y'all sakes and mine. Miss Camor, in line 140, you say, I know you'll get better. What does that mean? Get better at what? You gotta hit me, I carry you. Did he get better? No. Still on October 12th, um, going to line 133, it's a message from you. What does that say? Hey, all you fools are winning. At the bottom. So one at the bottom is Kmore 133. Are you good? You need your space to calm down so you wouldn't come home. Mad. No one is mad at you. They ate and now you watch TV. Hear it in the room. I put cream on her. What kind of cream were you putting on her? She was an antibiotic. In 132, what is his reply to you? Ate all the food, no play. Who is no play? What is that a reference to? Zakiria. Zakiria what? She can't play. <laughs> Why not? Because she was on the bench. Line 131, um, Dante's message to you. Kira was not supposed to eat. And then in 130? Nothing but vegetables. And then in 129. What did you do? And then your reply to him in 128. Your rice is almost done. Don't want nothing from the store. I might be going before you come home. Yes, they ate all. They food, carry and vegetables, and I had macaroni and chicken and vegetables. And then his reply in 127. You sure? And your reply in 126. They wasn't around each other, and yes, I'm sure. Why are you telling him they weren't around each other? He didn't want them around each other. Why not? He didn't want them mimicking each other. Mimicking each other? What does that mean? <sighs> like whatever Nadia did, he didn't want Kiri to do. Or whatever Kiri did, he didn't want Nadia to do. Okay. In um, line 125, your reply. They both had water. And then his reply in 124. Where was she? His reply in 123. Not in my living room. Who is she? Zakaria. Line 122, your reply? In the dining room, Dye was in the living room. And his reply in 121. Okay. Um. Going to, we're still on October 12th uh, at 8.58 in line 119, a message from Dante to you. <laughs> Is it the one that put it at? Yes, the one that's due to that. Watch these buttholes, it's nasty. And then he says in line 118. They add that voice for real. And your reply in line 116. No, they didn't watch because they ain't going nowhere. And I was waiting on you because you got you get mad when I do stuff like that. So I didn't want to piss you off. And his reply in 115. True, you right. His reply in 114. You good, baby. I just need you to discipline like me. Like watching her every move. His reply in 113. And tell her to stop being so mad because you're not a seek. His reply in 112. Don't have her killed. With too much anger. 111. To start earlier, the world us tipping them. You're a fine 110. And I don't know how to do to put like you, but I can watch every move. When you said that, what are you referring to when you say discipline like you? <laughs> I don't know how to lose control. I don't know how <laughs> to bump my fist up in it or child. Ms. Cannon, we're going to October 13th. This is 
at 2.59 in the morning, line 105, a message from John Day to you. I can't wait till she gets healed because she's getting terrible for her for real. And then in 104, she be everywhere. Line 103. I tried. I'm tired of her as a, as a five-year-old. Line 102. And I know we're not going to be together. Line 101. You're going to have me killed or locked up because of your child. Line 100. And this is all through, been through forever. Ms. Canmore, are you at work when you're receiving these messages? Yes. Line 99. I can't, I cannot deal with Carrie. Bad baby. She knows nothing or how to do nothing. She is a mess and I can't cry. Line 98. It's like we have an idiot child on our hands, bro. Line 97. When she feel she needs medicine or something because this shit here is ridiculous. Line 96. I can't wait to not pay her any attention. But he is very for real. Line 95. I'm so tired. Line 94. I'm drained of my energy. Line 93. One child has me tired and I've never been this tired with no one. And I'm fed up. Line 92. I don't like her. Line 91. Is she very much as the wrong energy from this part? Line 90. She is corrupt. Who is she? Vicaria. We're going to October 15th of 2018. Line 84, a message from Dante to you. What does it say? Line 84, Ms. Kenmore. I just woke up. Right here. Yes, Carrie was down to sleep. And then in 83. I just woke up and she was playing as soon as she got freedom. What is that a reference to? Freedom from what? From her womb. The room with the beds in it? No. Going to line 80, on, still on October 15th at 3.25 a.m. Message from Dante to you. They watched both of them. Line 79. She faces the choir. Line 78. You say. Oh my God. Please don't hurt her. And you watch both of them. Is that a statement? I was asking one question. Okay. What was the question you're asking in there? Did he watch both of them? Why are you asking him that? Because he texted me and said, I watched these people now. They say they watched both of them. Okay. Would it be normal for him to give them a bath at this time? No. Line 77, his reply to you? No. And then 76, your reply. He put her back in jail. What is jail? Her room. His reply to you in 75. She's human. His reply in 74. Yes. His reply in 73. She can't do what she wants. And your reply in 73. I know, baby, and I understand where you're coming from. Because that is such a beautiful. Still on October 15th of 2018, line 55, you send this message to him. Please read it. Don't know where your thing is on. Yes, ma'am. 
I heard other people say the way other choose a man before you stop feeling what I want to do, going to. <laughs> but I was saying to both of you, but then the other go, because she doesn't want me to be her mother. And I can't hurt. <laughs> and it hurts so much. The tears that I cry are the pain I hold inside because I'm trying to be the best mother. <laughs> Miss Canamore, when you're referring to letting her go, can you explain to the jury what you're talking about? I was going to let her go with her dad. Okay. Why? Because that's where she wanted to go. Did she express that? Is that yes? Yes, ma'am. Was that upsetting to you? Not really, because her dad is a good dad. He would have took care of her. But it was upset because I was her mother. His reply to you on 10 16 just after midnight in line 52. You will get her back. Line 51. Just needs a piece of her. Line 50. He's causing too much headache here. Line 49. She's not taking much of And then he. Joy. Okay. Uh, line 47. She no wrong or right. You get into the I don't care group. Line 46. But I'll start early. I do take it far, but I bet she knows not to play with me because it hurts me as much. <laughs> I don't want to hurt you. Line 44. Well, hold on, hold on a second, ma'am. Members of the jury, it's probably a good time to take our uh, last afternoon, late afternoon break. Uh, Put your pad on the chair and I'll discuss the case and we'll see you back shortly. Thank you, everyone. May be seated. Ms. Anderson, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Cannamore, we left off. Um, we're in October 16th of 2018, just after midnight, line 44, a message from Jante to you. No food, no drinks, no TV. I bet you are. Now she ready to run and shit. No man, you just fuck up. I don't want her around because my child is, going, is not going to ruin nothing. And trust, if she was older, I would have sent her to jail or kicked her ass out. Line 43. She is back up with shit. Her and her. Line 42. They don't want shit. In 
line 40, your message? Yeah, I know what you would have done if she was older. But it does hurt me because I got to keep cleaning up blood and not her abuses. However, you spell that word. It hurts because I don't need you to get that bad. I'm seeing me all over again. <laughs> but in my child. And I see if we have something here to help them. And I was cleaning up the grill and putting up cookies. <sighs> and okay. Wow, well, I'm sorry. That stands for client 39. Because I know what you picked up from. That's line 38. Okay, thank you. Miss <laughs> um, Cam, we're going to <clears throat> line 37. What does he say in line 37? Don't worry about it. She gonna come around. Line 36. She was picking out his cows. And your reply in line 35. And I truly know that's not you. I know you wouldn't hurt a child, oh, Jesse. I know you better than that. You have to control your anger. I know how to deal with you, and I love everything about you. <laughs> but I can't watch it happen anymore. That's why I stood in front of her. Can you explain to the jury what you're talking about there? <sighs> One day I got off work, and when I opened the doors, that kid was standing by the couch naked. <laughs> and jumped ahead of his. His mic stand in his hand. So I stood in front of her and told him to put it down. Miss Canmore, his reply to you in line 33. Oh, no. But she gotta know. Don't disrespect. But honestly, I'm done providing for a series. Line 32, his reply. And I guess I'm mad because she don't love me like I love her. And that's what it, it always be. Line 30 from you. And it makes me mad also because she doesn't want to love none of us. But her father. But I don't get so mad to where I hurt her. I put it in God's hands and let it be because he is worth of all of this. Can you fly in 29? Well, she's going with him. Is her fly in 28? I would feel better with one child anyway, I guess. Is her fly in 27? We can do better. We can do more and have more fun. Ms. Cannamore, I'm going to go back to some photographs. <clears throat> I'm showing you States Exhibit 39. What is this? The sleep medicine I'm going to work. And who would you give that sleep medicine to? Line 66, what is in the corner there? Just these mic stand. Is that the mic stand you talked about earlier? Yes, ma'am. And in 111, what is that? His mic stand. Line 76, what is that? A jump to his foot. Can you explain to the jury how that got there? So I carry her shoes on her own foot. Can y'all take a bed? When we picked her up, and he threw her on the carpet and started punching her. And his foot hit the wall. Where was he punching her? In the face and the stomach. Ms. Canmore, why did you never seek help? Because I was scared. 
here and I'm left. I didn't want to lose my girls. And I didn't want to go to jail. Do you acknowledge that you had opportunities to seek help? I did. Do you take responsibility in part for the death of your daughter? I do. At some point, you did call 911, correct? Yes. On October 17th, did something happen? Yes. Who all was home? Me, Jante, not even care. Was there an argument? Yes. Explain to the jury what that argument was about. Did Jante baby mama call me? And she asked for Jante's number, so I gave it to her. She told Jante that Jante Jr. said that one of my girls touched him. So Jante had kids in his He did. Was there a time that your girls and his kids were around each other? Yes. When was that? When I surprised them. Okay. Um, when I surprised Jante at his mom's house. Okay. I brought my kids to meet his. Did they also come over to the apartment at one point? They did. How many times have they been to the apartment? Once. Did any other adults come to the apartment? His mom. Did she drop them off? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did his kids stay the night? They did. What was Jante's reaction about this accusation? He was pissed. At who? Zakaria. What did he say? He said, I told you she did it. What did he tell Zakaria to do? Get out. Did he open the front door? Yes, ma'am. Miss Canmore, what's outside your front door? The field, the area with trees in the road. Was it nighttime? Yes. Is that road busy at night? Yes, ma'am. What was your reaction? So she not going nowhere? And it's okay to come in. Oh. You say that one more time. I told him she's not going anywhere. And I told Kiri to come in the house. When she came back inside, what happened? And I was closing the door. When I turned around, she was on the floor. Did you see how she got on the floor? No, ma'am. Did she get up again after she was on the floor? No. Did she say anything? No. Was she making noises? Yes. What kind of noises was she making? She was moaning like she was in pain. Did you say anything to Jante? What did you do? What did he reply? <laughs> he didn't do nothing. What did he do next? He went into the refrigerator and got a jug of water and poured it over her. Did she wake up? No. Do you remember about what time this happened? Like 8 something. How do you remember that it was around 8 something? Because I left my house at 8 45 to get on the bus to go to work. At the time, were you making dinner? I was. Did everyone eat? We did. Where was Kiri? Was she moving? No. Did you still go to work? I did. Were you on time? No. That night, did you walk to the bus stop alone? No, I didn't. Who walked with you? Jonesy. Where was Kiri? In the house. In the living room on the couch. Where was Naya? In the living room with her. About what time did you get to work? Like 10.45, it was 11 o'clock. Were you working with a woman named Shanika McFarland? I was. Is this someone that you worked with regularly? Yes, ma'am. Someone that you would communicate with outside of work? Yes, ma'am. 
Did she attempt to ask you what was going on? She did. Did you tell her anything? No. Why not? Because I was scared. I thought that she would judge me for not telling nobody what was going on in my house.
in the Circuit Court of the Fourth Judicial Circuit and in Fort Duval County, Florida, case number 2018-CF-10892. The State of Florida versus John K. Harris, verdict is to count one, first degree murder. We the jury find the defendant guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. Verdict is to count two, aggravated manslaughter of a child. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of aggravated manslaughter of a child as charged in the information. Verdict is to count three, aggravated child abuse. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of aggravated child abuse as charged in the indictment. So say we all, done at Jacksonville, Duval County, Florida, Jacqueline Boss, four person, February 8th, 2024. Would the defense like the jury call? Yes, Your Honor. Madam Clerk, if you would call the jury, please. Ms. Boss, were these your verdicts? Yes. Ms. Charles, were these your verdicts? Yes. Mr. Bowie, were these your verdicts? Yes. Ms. Buckner, were these your verdicts? Yes. Ms. McKenzie, were these your verdicts? Yes. Ms. Populous, were these your verdicts? Yes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Members of the jury, I wish to thank you for your time and consideration of the case, and I wish to advise you of a privilege enjoyed by jurors. No juror can ever be required to discuss what occurred in the jury room except by court order. For many centuries, we have relied on juries for consideration of difficult cases. We have recognized for that period of time that the jury's votes and discussions and deliberations should remain their private affair for as long as they wish it. And therefore, the law gives you that unique privilege not to speak about your work. Up to now, I've told you that you can talk about the case. Uh, that admonition is now gone. I'm about to discharge you from your jury service, and you can feel free to talk about the case or not talk about the case. It will be completely up to you. You leave here with my thanks for giving us four days uh, of your lives away from, uh, of your time, away from your lives and your jobs and your families to be down here. I told, uh, I told your fellow jurors, the alternate jurors, this uh, when they were leaving a couple hours ago, that uh, we ask a lot of jurors when you come down here. Uh, you never know, you get that summons and you come down to fulfill this extremely important civic duty and you never know what awaits you. Uh, are you here for a couple of hours and then get to go home? Are you going to sit on a trial involving uh, a DUI or somebody breaking a window somewhere or something like that? Or a case such as this, you just don't know. And uh, again, we ask a lot of you. And I've watched all of you this week. This has been an emotional week for you. Uh, but you never wavered in terms of your attention and your seriousness of purpose that you uh, that you paid to the case. Uh, and you did uh, you did what I expected that you would do, which is to fulfill your duty in a very solemn and appropriate manner. Uh, and I thank you very much. Uh, for that, and uh, as does everyone here in the courthouse. Uh, but with that, uh, you're free to go. We will uh, escort you to your great place, and thank you very much. You'll get a letter from me in the next uh, week or two with an email and a phone number. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Or comments. Mr. Harris, the jury having found you guilty of the three charges. Uh, in the indictment, the court revokes any bond previously set for managing to the custody of the sheriff to await sentencing. Uh, obviously, there's only one sentence as to uh, count one. Uh, but as to uh, all of the charges, Mr. Uh, Harris is entitled to a PSI. Are you requesting one? Yes, sir. All right. We'll order a pre sentence investigation report to be ordered. As we know, that takes about four weeks. So I would propose that we pass the case to uh, four weeks from this coming Monday, which would be March the 11th, for sentencing to be set that week. Everybody good? Your Honor, I will just need to um, speak with the victim's family. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and attempt to set it for that week, and then uh, if there's a problem, parties let me know. March the 11th for sentencing to be set. Any further business to come before the court on Mr. Harris's case today? No, Your Honor. Nothing from the Fed, Your Honor. Thank you. We are in recess. Thank you. Right, sir. Right, this way.
guilty on all counts. The Jacksonville man standing trial for the murder of this little girl. This is fi a five-year-old who was killed in 2018. Her killer will spend the rest of his life in prison. John Tay Harris was on trial this week for the death of Zakaria Robinson. The jury returned a verdict just within the past two hours. There are moments after the verdict, I was on the phone with the grandmother of Zykeria Robinson, the five-year-old girl who was murdered. She tells me that she is glad everything turned out the way it did with the verdict. Jonte Harris was found guilty by the jury and it only took them a little over two hours to do this. That is guilty of first degree murder, aggravated manslaughter of a child and aggravated child abuse. As prosecutors, we are the voice for the victims and we are the strength for the victims.